Good morning, everybody. So, thank you so much for being here today. Good to see you all. Uh, I'm very pleased to have been able to use the bell for the first time straight away. <laughs> um, we have various, uh, various guests with us today who I will introduce as we go on. Uh, but first of all, let me welcome uh, Reverend um, Claire Downing, who is the transitional moderator for the North Western Synod of the United Reformed Church. Claire, it's really good to have you with us, and I'm going to hand over to you to begin our meeting today. Good morning. Um, I, I tend not to use the transitional word. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in a three-year timed post, which is deliberately transitional, but basically I'm it. So it's a joy to be with you this morning and to lead you in your opening worship. And I want us to start, I, I can hear you in good voice, at least speaking voice, because of the need for the bell. Um, but I hope you're in good singing voice. We're just going to start with a Gloria, which I suspect a number of you will know. It's normally known as a Peruvian Gloria. I sing a line, you sing it back, and we get when we get to the Alleluia Amen bit at the end, then we just keep singing it, I sing it once, you sing it three times, and if you're feeling clever, you harmonise. Okay? It's very simple. We'll sing it through twice, okay? Glory to God, glory to God, glory in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, glory in the highest. To God be glory forever. To God be glory forever. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. passage from Philippians chapter 4. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is God's word, and it can be trusted. I've been doing some work with the Book of Philippians with our Synod Moderator meeting, which is 13 of us from around the UK who meet together monthly, and it's been my turn to chair. So I'm afraid what you're getting is a little bit of a rehash of what they've had already. But we've all been there, haven't we? 
And this is a passage, or at least the second half of it, which is one of those passages which sort of sits in me. I first really came across it when I was in my teens, new to the faith, and as part of some great sort of teenage get-together of different Bible groups from around the place. I learnt this off by heart for a scripture recitation uh, competition. It's in the RSV in my, in my brain. That shows my age a bit. But there's three words I really want to pick out from here as we meet together today. You might have noticed but often it is the second half of it that we read, and not the first bit. We start with my first word, which is rejoice. But I just want to take you back for a moment to the first paragraph of this, where Paul is pleading with two women who are part of the mission team, the ministry team in Philippi, to get on with each other. And I, rem I, I put that part in to remind us, firstly, that the early church was not perfect. I mean, the whole reason for all these letters to churches is because they were making a mess of things. Which on the one hand is a bit sad, and on the other hand is encouraging, because we too have the ability to make a mess of things. <coughs> but it's in the context of this, this difficulty within the church, that Paul is able to say, rejoice, be joyful. We don't have to get things perfect before we can smile. Rejoice. It's a wonderful word, word isn't it? Be joyful. Now, I've heard you singing this morning. I know you can sing joyfully. And I hope that in this meeting and all the things that are on the agenda, Whatever else happens, however cross we might get inside about certain things, can we, as Christian people, be people of joy? Because if we're not, then the people around us will notice. And if we are, then people might just be attractive. So rejoice, one word. The next one, not so good. Anxiety. Now, I suspect if I'd had half an hour to spare and to set you off round tables to talk about what makes you anxious, I would have had a real problem shutting you up. <laughs> don't be anxious. Now, that's don't fear. It's not don't fear. Um, have you ever seen a driver who doesn't fear? They are really scary. <laughs> Fear is actually quite a useful thing at times. But anxiety just eats away at us. Many, many moons ago, I did a degree in psychology, and we read all sorts of things about experiments that would not be allowed today. I mean, really horrible stuff. But one of the things that I remember was an experiment which had rats who learned anxiety. Basically, they were given little electric shocks at random times, and they became totally anxious. And they couldn't get over it. They couldn't actually settle into normal life. Now, I don't want to go around repeating such experiments, but that idea of learned anxiety is something that I think there's a bit too much of in the church. We get anxious about all sorts of things. And again, recognising that I am sure, because any synod meeting has difficult things on the agenda, anxiety levels for some people might be high. But do not be anxious, but by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, hand things over to God. And I hope that as we meet today, that's one thing that we can do. And my third word is peace. 
And you've probably all spotted this years ago, but a little while back I suddenly noticed that in this short passage, Paul talks both about the peace of God and the God of peace. So when he's talking about handing things over to God, he says, and the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, will guard us. And then the God of peace will be with you. Now again, peace. It's one of those words that it, it's too, it, it's just not clever enough in English. Translation is hard, isn't it? There are so many things where you lose stuff in translation. But that peace, that shalom, that wholeness, that is who God is. The God of peace, of wholeness. And it's that peace that God can give us. Not a peace that says everything's all right with the world so I don't need to do anything. But a peace that surrounds us and guards us so that we can get on with bringing God to the world. So as we meet today, my prayer is that our anxieties can be handed over to God and that we will be people of peace and of joy. So we'll pray together. Loving God, as we look at the world around us, it's difficult to find things to be joyful about. And peace seems to be far away. And so we bring to you, in a moment of quiet, the places and people that concern us. And we hand those anxieties to you. And we come to pray for your church, for the Diocese of Carlisle and for ecumenical partners, for the church growing in many places in the world and struggling in many places here. And we ask that we will be seen to be people of joy people of peace, those who are not disabled by anxiety. And we pray for this meeting today, for the business that needs to be done, for listening ears, for your voice through the voice of others and within us, and ask your blessing on each one here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> one more song, again one that I suspect some of you will be familiar with. It came down that we might have love. Um, and it's, you, you repeat that three times and then it's Alleluia forevermore. And then we have joy and then we have peace. So if I end up singing the first verse by myself, then that'll be all right. But please join in when you can. He came down that we might have love. He came down that we might have love. He came down that we might have love.
Lord, set your blessing on us as we begin this day together. Confirm in us the truth by which we rightly live. Confront us with the truth from which we wrongly turn. We ask not for what we want, but for what you know we need, as we offer this day and ourselves for you and to you, through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Very thanks, Claire, for that, uh, for op opening us this, with those, those thoughts, reminding us of those things we need to think about and, and, and live, live in. And, uh, and I also noticed that we all, obviously, a lot of us knew, uh, knew the songs. So that was a really good way to start, so thank you. Um, apologies, I've currently got seven from the House of Clergy, 13 from the House of Laity, and I should note that the House of Bishops are entirely here. 100%. <laughs> I have to get my stroke somewhere. Um, anyway, um, the minutes of the last meeting on the 14th of October. Um, are we able to approve those minutes? Or are, any, are there any, anything that needs to be notified of changes that are needed to them? Okay, we're happy to, to approve them then. Kind of general nodding of, yeah, thank you. Um, matters arising, I haven't had any notified to me. Um, in terms of my piece on the uh, Dallas Investment Programme bid, uh, I'll be covering that uh, later on when we're talking about God for All. Um, but was there, was there anything else? Is there? Okay. Good. In which case, we can move swiftly on, I think. To, uh, to safeguarding, and I'm going to move seats, or I'm going to stand up for the next bit. <coughs> I apologise that as the day goes on, both chairing and, um, uh, and presenting on various things, that you're going to be hearing a lot from me today. Um, but I will start off by uh, doing the presentation of the safeguarding report. Um, First of all, may I introduce uh, Alan Harder? Alan, do you want to stand up for a moment? Just so we're going to, you're going to stand up and speak just in a minute, but I know, but we'll see who you are. <laughs> um, Alan has recently taken over as uh, the chair of, our, of the um, DOS and uh, Safeguarding Advisory Panel, which is sort of an, an independent panel that, that seeks to oversee, support, um, give challenge and uh, an outward kind of scrutiny to our safeguarding work. Um, Carol Holt, uh, as, the, as Joe's report notes, uh, resigned last year in March, and we are just delighted to have someone of uh, Alan's uh, 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 background and experience in this role. Alan, we are really grateful that you've taken this, this role on, and already we, I, I certainly am feeling the, the benefits of, uh, of having you in that role in terms of the support, advice, and challenge that you've brought in that, in that role. Um, what, before I, I'm, I'm not going to go through this report that Joe has has uh, has given to us uh, in, blow by blow, bit by bit, because I'm assuming and, and and expecting that either you've already read it or that you will go home and read it and that you will pick out the things that, that are necessary from it. Um, I, I just want to to note really just the amount of work that Joe does on our behalf. Uh, because currently what her role involves is that she has support with, uh, with training and there's been a really good development in terms of training the trainers. Uh, one of, of course one of our issues is that, that getting people to travel, as you have done today, to our uh, training is, is often a big ask. And if there are lots of people in particular areas of the county that we need to train, it's really good that we manage to, have a, a, to train some trainers to do that training locally to raise the profile and um, understanding of safeguarding. But Joe has to kind of juggle both the casework um, in, its, in, its, in its incredible variety with the, 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 the strategy work of, of actually 
how are we developing new things? How are we taking on board the requirements that are being set nationally? How are we keeping up with the, uh, with the various developments? And then uh, and the, and the general sort of encouragement, support, and uh, an enabling of safeguarding and safeguarding cultures across the diocese. So, so we're asking them to do quite a lot of uh, things within with both casework and uh, strategy development. And I think you'll see from this, uh, from this report that actually she's done an incredible amount of work. Um, one of the things I think I also want to say, and is because sometimes there's a, a sort of, there can be, a, a, from, from my inbox, uh, a, um, a sort of an idea that safeguarding has gone mad. Rather like, remember, political correctness used to go mad. Well, well now safeguarding, sometimes we'll say it's gone mad. But actually, we have, we have such, a, um, such a poor record in the past. That's not to deny that there are many things which we, we have done well and right over the years. But safeguarding is something which I think is our, um, our duty as followers of Christ. To, to, to love, protect, and, and ensure the safety of those who are most vulnerable. Surely that is something that we see in Scripture, of God's heart for, the, for those who are vulnerable. And, and, and safeguarding, even if sometimes it might use phrases or, um, uh, or, or, or particular, particular ways of expressing policy that, that we don't relate to, we don't understand, the heart of it is surely to protect the vulnerable, no matter what age they are, what a stage of life they are in. And so I want to encourage us, particularly those of us who might think that safeguarding is a bit of a, we've all got a bit out of hand, that it hasn't got out of hand. It is something that we need to continue to challenge ourselves on so that we protect people. That we don't simply say, you know, this thing doesn't matter. This, this, this thing that's happened doesn't matter. The way this person's behaving, well, it's just them. Or the, the way that we recruit people to things is, is simply, a, oh, well, just, well, we know that. We know this person. We, well, this, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I'll, I'll skip these steps. I know just some of you will share with me experience of where that hasn't been done well and where the, the mess that is left in people's lives is enormous. And where actually being careful, careful, would have protected people and also ensured that, that we could stand up and say, as a church, as followers of Christ, we have done that thing that we needed to do to protect people. So, so let me, I, I will not continue to labour this point other than to say, let me encourage each one of us not to think that safeguarding is another thing that we just have to do, it's a right pain, but rather to understand it as part of the care that we, we owe people in Christ's name. And I'm really grateful to all those of you who put in such time to make, to, to, to do a good job of this. And I'm really grateful to those people who sit on, on the panel with Alan, those people who have taken on responsibilities, um, safeguarding offices in parish, parishes, and I'm really grateful to Jo for the amazing work that she does. In, in, um, and, 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 and having sat with her in, in some fairly difficult meetings with people, I, I, I th and those of you who, who've had to do that too will, will know that the professionalism and care that she, she brings in those situations. So, it has been, as you see, a very busy uh, year in safeguarding, and there's a lot of, of change coming up. Um, we, um, uh, we've been part of, uh, of a national programme, a pilot programme. One of the advantages of that has been the fact that we have, uh, we've had lots more external scrutiny. We've been able to kind of tap into external support, uh, advice, um, uh, um, and challenge, which, is, which has helped us in our practice and in the development of the things that we're doing. Um, this has all come out of, the, of ICSA, which is the Independent Investigation into uh, um, child sexual abuse, which a number of organisations have, have been particularly uh, scrutinised uh, in. And so we have been part of the national pilot and project that's come out of that. 
um, which has given us extra resources, extra support. And we are, we've learned a lot through that. And we will continue to do that so it finishes uh, over the coming weeks. But some of, some of the work that's come through that, particularly uh, external support for Joe in terms of professional uh, supervision, will continue. Um, some of this has been sort of thrown up in the air a bit by, um, you, you may have come across the Jay report. Uh, Alexis Jay, who, who had been the chair of Elixir, um, was asked to come up with a plan for how we might have uh, fully independent safeguarding in the Church of England. That was brought to General Synod uh, the other week, and uh, work has been further work has been done, done on that. Now, as some of you will have noticed uh, in the news and elsewhere, um, it, is not, it has been another unhappy year in safeguarding in the Church of England, with a lot of pain, a lot of argument. Um, I wonder whether some of the, the pause that is now being placed on it by Synod, in terms of saying we're not going to decide now, we need some further work on this, is not a kicking into the long grass, but rather a, um, a, a proper pause. Because there is a danger, isn't there, of we must do something, this is something, let's do it. And there's always a danger of that, isn't there? And so my prayer is that that's what, we're, what we are doing, in fact, is to think, how do we do this well? Nobody is, nobody I don't think, or people shouldn't be, against independent scrutiny. To have, have the standards that are set elsewhere applied to us and to be transparent and accountable for how we're doing it. But of course there is a, there is a difficulty and a, and a discussion about how we do this well in terms of operational independence. I can tell you for certain that Joe is entirely independent and, and, and rightly so, has, no, has no, no worry about challenging me if I think, if she thinks that I am not, um, not doing the right thing. So, so you, you can be assured that Joe is entirely independent and I, I can see you nodding. Those others who work with her would agree with that. So, so we, there is a state of flux still within the national structures which we will need to respond to. Um, locally, uh, obviously Joe continues as, as our safeguarding advisor. Uh, we now have Kerry Ellis, who has started as the safeguarding administrator, which has been after some, some flux in that locally. Um, it's been a really great development in terms of supporting Joe and her work and supporting parishes in what they need, to, uh, need from us to do their work. Um, Alan has arrived as safeguarding chair. Um, in, in uh, succession to Carol Holt. Now I don't know whether we have formally said thank you to Carol, who having been a um, uh, the reviewer for our, pa uh, our past cases review um, and did a great work with that, and then came on and supported us as independent safeguarding chair. I don't know whether she she sort of just slipped out of the back door in between synods, but I, if we haven't said a formal thank you to her. I think on behalf of the Synod, I'd want to do that. Would we, oh, that's not okay. So if we could record that and, uh, and pass it on to her. Um, as I said before, we've got safe, we have um, people uh, who are uh, independent safeguarding trainers supporting Joe in our work across the diocese. And um, uh, Richard has been safeguarding uh, lead archdeacon and will be stepping down, of course, when he retires at the end of the month. Um, I think I, there will be plenty of opportunity to say thank you to Richard for all the things he's done, but, but I think particularly in this moment, in this item, I would want to recognise what Richard has done in support of safeguarding over very many years. That he has been a real, real champion, advocate, and, and fearless champion and advocate for it over many years. Uh, and I know that because, as some of you will, will know or remember, my wife Emma was the safeguarding advisor many years ago and worked with Richard on it through some fairly difficult situations. And, and, and she would come home and say what a wonderful support Richard had been to her. Uh, dogged, wise and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and kind. 
So, uh, so I think, although we will say lots of nice things about Richard over the coming weeks, I think particularly in relation to this, Richard has been a, a, a real, um, real gem in supporting that. Thank you, Richard. Uh, safeguarding casework, um, as Jo says, her casework has increased. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, things have got worse, uh, but rather that that can and probably is a mark of the trust that people have in Jo and the relationship that she has sought to build uh, personally with parishes and mission communities. Um, so people have felt more able to go to her with concerns, seeking, for, seeking advice. Uh, so, so the casework has, um, has increased, but that, we can think of that as being a good, a good sign of actually more openness, transparency, and the desire to get this right. So that's good. Um, again, I, I should leave you to read other, uh, other parts of that. Um, we continue to respond to uh, the developments nationally in terms of training that we need, <coughs> need to do. Um, there's also the raising awareness of domestic abuse, the need for us to be uh, mindful of that and to, uh, to care for others in, in, in how, we, how we look for that and, or, or spot the signs of it. Um, but then also there is um, the parish safeguarding dashboards which has been very encouraging to see actually without much um, we haven't had to apply a stick about parish safeguarding dashboards that people have seen the, the benefit of them <clears throat> not, not as yet another thing to do but rather as a thing that helps us to do well the thing that we're trying to do that it's a tool um, in a moment I'm going to, uh, we're going to put a, a video in Charles Hope is going to give, the, uh, uh, give, a, give his recommendation for the, uh, for the parish safeguarding dashboards. I should say that one of the things that's been interesting about it has, is how people have taken it up themselves. That people have seen the work of it and said, we'd like to try that. So hopefully, with that recommendation and Charles's, those of you in your parishes who have, uh, you haven't taken it up yet, will, will give it some thought. So they, they are a tool for helping us do it more straightforwardly and, and helpfully. So they are, they are a good thing rather than, oh, another thing we've got to do. They are a real help and aid to this piece of work. So I'm going to turn, we're going to have uh, Charles's recommendation. So to say, if, if, if your parish isn't using those yet, do, um, do look at the, uh, the information we sent out with the, with, uh, with the report uh, and see whether that might be something that you, you, you could take up over the coming year. So um, priorities for development in 2024, we're preparing for uh, the unique audit. That's uh, basically part of this, um, uh, of, of the national work, is that we need to have our, as one of the pilot dioceses, to have our safeguarding practice uh, to be audited externally. Uh, that's going to happen actually in a year's time, but will require quite a lot of work this year to make sure that we've got all, everything in place. Um, Again, with all the changes that are coming up, Joe will need to update our development plans for safeguarding the diocese to take into account the national safeguarding standards and um, using the, the best tools that we use for quality assurance. We're wanting to roll out further the safeguarding dashboards to support parishes. Um, there's also the implementation of the national safeguarding casework management system, um, which is, I have to say, I was hearing from another bishop recently Although, in one sense, that feels like another thing that we're doing, this person I was speaking to said that it had been really, really helpful in, in, spotting, in spotting the thing that, that had slipped through, um, in enab enabling them to deal really well and quickly with an issue that, was, that, 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 that could have become really, really difficult. The, but, the, but actually, having a, the, the casework management system had, had enabled them to prevent a much bigger issue later on. And then finally, and I think I want to finish this because this is really important, Joe's work and our work, the desire to support, recognise and develop um, parish safeguarding officers because 
Those of you who are parish safeguarding officers, those of you who work with your parish safeguarding officers will know what a critical role it is. And actually how it's so often undertaken by people who, who, who don't have a safeguarding background, who are maybe very busy doing other things. And I want to say thank you to, to all those who are involved in that work, because it's critical. And, and, and there's, a, there's a great way to, people can feel a great weight of responsibility for doing it well, and, um, but, it, but actually it's a critical way in which we can help our churches care for people well. So the more we can do, and this is what we are looking to do more of this, the more we can do to support parish safeguarding officers, the better. To value them, to train them, to support them, because it's a big job and a, 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 a significant and sometimes difficult job they do on our behalf. So, so, so thank you to you and to them for that. And the more we can do over this year to support them as part of the work that one of the key priorities for this coming year. Um, I'm going to finish there, and um, Alan's going to come and speak to us, um, and then I'm, I hope that we can have some some time for questions or comments afterwards, if there are any. Alan. I always worry, worry, worry when I'm asked to stand up because most people don't notice the difference. <laughs> Can you see me at the back? And most importantly, can you hear me? You don't have to look there. Thank you very much for inviting me to come today. And also, the warm welcome that I've received in the diocese since starting as the uh, independent chair to DSAP in September of last year. What I want to do today is just uh, explain to uh, a couple of things about myself, my background, so that you know where I, who I am and what I'm about and where I've come from. But equally about what the role and the function of DSAP is, because I'm not sure if everybody fully understands its function and how it's made up and its members. Uh, I also want to reflect on some of the work that has been completed over the last 12 months and where I see that the diocese needs to move towards in the coming year and beyond that. Okay, so uh, I'm Alan Harder. Uh, despite my height, before uh, coming to be the independent chair. I used to be a police officer, which is something I did for over 30 years. Uh, within that role, that is a role that is about protecting people, making sure that people are safe, uh, and that we protect the most vulnerable people. And that's what isn't dissimilar to the church in many respects, about looking after those vulnerable people. And that is a value that has stayed with me through those 30 years and beyond which is one of the reasons why uh, I want to work as, as the, with DSA. As a police officer, I was involved with lots of extraordinary things uh, and was also uh, had a very uh, unique opportunity to impact against people's lives positively uh, in relation to victims, but also to deal with some of the offenders that we would deal with of, uh, that, through our normal uh, work business. And each of those groups of people needed the support, whether or not it's around the rehabilitation of offenders or protecting victims from further harm. That still stands now. Within policing, I was a detective at every role, and toward the latter parts of my career, was responsible for investigating some of the more serious offences, such as murders, manslaughter, kidnap, uh, but also non-recent abuse within religious settings and places of worship. Uh, that involved a number of investigations, not within Cumbria, uh, but you understand the impact that this has with victims, the long-lasting impact it has, mm -hmm. and how it takes time for people to be able to come forward and share those experiences. But a key part of safeguarding is about working with partners and drawing on those experiences that partners have from their own areas of professional uh, responsibilities sharing information so that we can achieve the best results for those people that we all want to protect and safeguard with. Sadly, that also included completing a number of say, uh, case reviews where safeguarding wasn't as effective as perhaps where we would have wanted it to be. And throughout that, 
one of the main recommendations with all reviews is about sharing of information about what people knew, were people willing to share that information. And I think that still stands now and is a critical part of safeguarding in terms of what should you be raising, who you should be raising it to, and why. Because if we don't, those vulnerable people can be hurt, and that's what we want here to do. So, let's stop talking about me, and let's talk about DSAP. So DSAP, uh, there's a terms of reference for DSAP that gets reviewed on an annual basis in terms of what it is, its members, and its function in relation to the diocese. And the DSAP, the Diocesan Safeguarding Advisory Panel, is a source of independent advice for the diocese. And it is, that advice is based on the expertise of its members, from, which include members of the clergy and also from the cathedral, uh, and independent members from the local authority, third sector as well. And they are professionals who have been engaged with safeguarding at a senior level and are able to provide advice and professional challenge to the diocese. And that's so that the diocese can strengthen and develop its practice and its procedures to make sure that people are safe across Carlisle, uh, Cumbria. It's important that we are able to have that professional challenge uh, with the diocese because communities across the country need to have confidence in terms of what's being delivered from a safeguarding perspective. And that scrutiny, uh, so that challenge can be delivered either through scrutiny, uh, through reviews, and also through support. And it's done in a professionally challenging way, I hope, without just being blunt in relation to that. But it's important that we do that with regard to the national standards that are delivered by the National Church of Practice Guidance, but also the best practice that those independent members have through their own uh, professional being. So, next 12 months. When I arrived as, as the independent chair in September last year, I, there was a number of documents I read straight away in terms of your PCR2 report and its findings and its recommendations. Some of the recent uh, uh, minutes from uh, certain meetings across the diocese as well. And what stood out is that there is a, a commitment and a want of people to deliver safeguarding across the diocese, which is a really good place for me to start in. And I've got to thank Carol for the work that she's done before for that. But actually, there's some ways that that work could be done and strengthened to be able to move forward. And at the first meeting, a Bishop Bob asked me, what do we think we need to make the Diocese of Carlisle a safe place for people to come and visit and worship in our churches? And we went through those. And very quickly, and from there, we've been able to uh, complete a risk register in terms of what are the risks around safeguarding, what does that look like? And it is a big piece of work, and I thank the partners who helped us to complete that document. But that shows some of the additional work and the amount of work that needs to be completed to, in, in the year ahead. Now, We've heard about Joe being mentioned a few times today as the Diocesan Safeguarding Advisor. And a lot of people think if she's our safeguarding advisor, Joe will do that. Joe will look after that. That's Joe's responsibility. And all too often in other organisations, I've heard that comment of, we've got somebody who does that. Pass it to that person, they'll do it. We don't need to worry about that. We've got somebody. That's our safeguarding response, Joe. Okay? That is the biggest mistake anybody can make. Safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. Okay? And in any unfortunate situation where that needs to be reviewed as to who knew what at what time, we will be looking at that. Because it's right and proper to do that. Because if we fail to protect somebody, we need to understand why and how we move forward from that. So please, don't think it's just Joe. It's all of us. So whether or not that's from somebody who just uh, uh, greets, meets and greets people at the church on a Sunday, all the way through to uh, Bishop Clark. So, ahead, the inspection, the audit in 2025. Something new, a uh, new structure, but it's going to measure us 
against the five safeguarding standards that have been documented and reported upon. And I know this will cause some concern and some anxiety, but actually that's not the way I'm going to see that. My view is that this is an opportunity for external review, external advice, external feedback, and no doubt it will give us some opportunity to learn, identify what is really working well across the diocese, and bring that together so we can make sure that we are a safer place in 25 and we're halfway through 25 and beyond. Because that's what we want, isn't it? That advice. How do we improve? Because being good is not good enough. We need to be better in everything that we do. So, does anybody know what the standards are? Sorry, does anybody know what the standards are? I've got them all, but I'm trying to think of off the top of my head. I should know. I'll help. We'd love you to tell us. Remind us. Okay. First one. Culture, leadership and capacity. Safeguarding isn't something that's just done at a, a level in a church or in a school or in a hospital on a ward. Safeguarding is set in terms of how leaders behave and they set the standard and expectation. So it's right that the, note, the first standard that is talking about is around culture and leadership. And the fact that you're here today actually shows that you've got a role within that standard. And that's that church bodies have, have a safe and healthy culture. There's effective leadership, there's resourcing, and there's scrutiny arrangements necessary to deliver a high standard of safeguarding of practices and outcomes across the diocese. Did you know you're responsible for that? I'm pleased lots of people are nodding. Prevention. If we can stop somebody getting hurt or becoming a victim, that has got to be better than the subsequent need to deliver support to the individual. So it's around the church bodies having in place planned arrangements of measure which would together, sorry, which would together are effective in preventing. Uh, abuse in the church. We need to prevent it. So again, what are we doing across the diocese to make sure that those people who might want to come to the church to abuse people are prevented? We also need to make sure the third standard is recognising, assessing and managing risk. Risk assessments. Making sure that we've got safety plans in place. Because the church is a place for everybody. And it's important that anybody can come to the church and worship. Okay? Irrespective of what they've done before, because that's what the church is about, about forgiveness. But what we need to make sure is anybody coming into the church can do that in a safe way for them and a safe way for other people who attend. So that's about having those right plans, quality plans in place, which are positive with positive outcomes to support people. Victims and survivors is the fourth standard that is being talked about within the audit. And that's about drawing on the victims and survivors' experience uh, in, and how the diocese responds to any disclosures that are made. And then the final one is around learning, supervisors and support. And I think the content of that actually speaks for itself. Each of those five standards have got a set of what looks good, uh, and some helpful quality assurance t tools that are available on, the, on the, the National Church website. But in preparation for that inspection, Joe, and uh, under the direction of Derek, will be developing a, a review mechanism to benchmark where we are now and what needs to be done. And that's not so that the inspection sees everything that's nice and clean and tidy, but actually help, so, uh, so that we know ourselves and what we need to do in the future moving forward. And that piece of work can't be underestimated uh, in relation to that. It's important to just recognise that a lot of that inspection will talk about and look at culture, which I think is really important for ourselves to just reflect on that. So, what am I looking for in the year, in the year ahead? Obviously, the inspection will be an important part of the work. We also need to work out how do we develop the safeguarding response uh, across the diocese. 
And there's a couple of areas that I, I think there are opportunities for that, so that we can support Jo in the work that she's doing. Because the work that Jo has done around training, raising awareness, has had some positive outcomes. The feedback that I've heard and uh, had about the training is that it's positive, and people get a lot out of it and there's learning from it. But as leaders in the church, actually, are you making sure that the people within your uh, archdeaconries and, and your parishes actually have got the necessary training to the right levels in terms of the leadership training? Have that consideration if you, in, in terms of making sure that has been done. But with all training and awareness, it's going to result in an increase in reports, which I see as a positive, okay? Because it means people have got the confidence, A, in the training, and they've also got the confidence in Joe to be able to make those reports that they're going to be handled in a professional and responsible manner. And we need to maintain that. So we also need to ensure that Joe is able to respond to those as her primary role, but also deliver some of the other pieces of work as well. So in order to do that, I think there are opportunities around working further with our parish safeguarding offices that have got such an important role as the gatekeepers for safeguarding or at, at that parish level and in, in working with Joe. But also to look at what are the opportunities? Is it feasible to have an operational group about drawing on some other people to do some of that work that Joe needs to do as opposed to just dressing on one person's set of shoulders and draw on the experiences across the entire diocese as opposed to just Joe's. Bishop Wobb's already touched on the parish dashboards and the importance that they've got, uh, which I won't repeat what it's been through. The DSAP has been supported by a number of independent members uh, from statutory and the voluntary organisations. And each of those organisations have their own internal challenges. And it's very easy at a time of challenge for you to withdraw from partnerships and be internal. But that presents a risk. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that it has occurred, but what I want to make sure is that the DSAP has the right representation from partner agencies. So work has already started to develop our membership, that we've got more people on there, and representation from the other uh, partner agencies, so that we can draw on their safeguarding experiences and improve the practice that we have across the, the, the diocese, and also to ensure that we have the right professional challenge coming back to us together. And then finally, there's a lot taking place. There's a lot taking place in the diocese. There's a lot for us to do together and move forward and support them. And there's also a lot taking place at the national, national church level. Uh, and, and Bishop Rob has spoken about the report that's being prepared by Professor Alexis Chen. That's talking about two separate organisations, one that will take responsibility for safeguarding and one around an inspection and audit across dioceses. Those full details have been published. It was a lot of debate at the National Synod in relation to that. And people have got divided views. And likewise, those views nationally will be replicated at a local level as well. And no matter what decision is made, and we will follow that through, we need to understand that that will cause anxiety and concerns locally and nationally. But we need to make sure that we work with those and with the stakeholders to make sure that the results are best for those people that we either join the church for, to make sure that they're safe and that we deliver safeguarding in that professional way across the entire diocese. So I'd just like to say thank you. And are there any questions? I wasn't sure if we should ask the last bit, but are there any questions? <laughs> It's good to hear that Jo is getting additional support, but does she have the right level of support uh, to ensure that she's doing the job that she's been called to do? Thank you. Sorry. That's a really good question. And it's important that the DSAP know what the resources are in terms of safeguarding. 
do we have the right resources in place to be able to respond to the demand that's coming in? And that demand is in terms of uh, reports, concerns, liaison, safety plans. There's a lot of work that's involved with that. And likewise, there's some additional work around the development of the, the case system, parish dashboards, the engagement with parish safeguarding officers. So we're actually that, there's a lot of work in there. Uh, in terms of, do you have the right resources? to have the right risk of support. One of the positive experiences that I've had since being in, since September is being able to raise that with both Bishop Rob and Derek so we can have that conversation. So actually we can gauge it, we can assess it, is it right at the right level? And I know that she needed some support around the admin and very quickly that's been provided and, and replaced with something left. So I think there is that commitment to provide that support and the fact that we can have that conversation and discuss it and what those opportunities may or may not look like moving forward is really important to make sure that she is. I think, I think all I'd say is that, to add to that, thank you, is that um, we have done some benchmarking with other dioceses in terms of seeing what, what, what resource they provide. Um, and uh, and we, we do have a further meeting coming up very shortly in which we will be discussing what, what we do about that. So. Susie, then, then Margaret. Joel is extremely assiduous and really, really detailed and really committed and isn't afraid, as you've already pointed out. I wonder if there isn't room for another level of Joel, someone who can screen some of the stuff that comes towards her, um, someone of real experience in um, safeguarding issues because of course when you get someone good the muck comes up to the surface um, i think we will see more safeguarding issues come to light because it's now safe for them to come to light because they're going to be addressed thoroughly and properly and i worry that joe is actually overworked because i work with her closely um, and i'm concerned that she hasn't got enough time she She's good at boundaries, but I think she does take work home. So lengthy reports, for example, she will do at weekends. I'm concerned that Jo might reach burnout if she doesn't get a level below her that can screen the stuff that comes from PSOs, that can screen the stuff that comes from um, perhaps clergy reporting. <laughs> can I just have a word? That would be my suggestion. Susie, thank you. I'm certainly, I don't know, I'm not saying anything, but I think I'd, I'd say I, I, I note that carefully. Yeah. And, and that's what we need to do, sit down. What can be done? How do we do it? And where does that come from? And I think that's where some of the other work, the operational work, the embedding of dashboards, the, the development of policies and practice, actually, should that sit on one person's shoulders or can an operational group deliver that? Drawing on the experience around the room. So there are some other ways to do that, and I think they all need to be explored uh, to do that. But you're right, we don't want anybody to burn out or leave because that in, uh, uh, introduces other elements of risk. And actually, when we've gone through the risk register with partners uh, in the last few weeks, that is one of those areas that are listed in there. So actually we can put plans into place, which we've started to do. Thank you. Oh, that's absolutely right. Um, it's just a comment really, um, given I'm not aware, I'm actually representing, I think that's the word, PSOs on the DSAC. And Joe and I are going to be talking how I can actually represent them, you know, so whether it's some sort of meetings with PSOs, but um, the fact that I'm on the DSAC is not just for me, I'm representing all PSOs. So, um, just you know, watch this stage when Joe and Joe gets back from a holiday as well. We've seen how how I can be able to do that. It's not supposed to enjoy their job, and it's not people sending concerns to me, no way at all. But it's it's a route for them to have access to the detail. Am I right there, Alan? You are, because it's not just coming for your own knowledge. Yeah. Actually, it's an opportunity for PS, PSOs to share information with uh, Margaret. Together, that information bring it back. So actually, it's put those roots, pathways into place 
which reduces some of those demands in the right way. Uh, and equally, opportunities on how do we bring our peer, PSOs together. Actually, is there an opportunity for forums, meetings, so actually the information and the knowledge can be shared in the appropriate ways to do that as well. Okay, did I see another hand? Um, actually, Christine and then Glenn. Thank you, Alan. You referred to a risk register, and I just wondered, um, is that at parish level? What? The risk, was the risk register that we did was at a diocesan level, but it reflects on some of the issues that might take place in parish. So actually, for example, are we, do we get the reports through that should come through in relation to safeguarding? Because that might be a failure at a parish level, because of lack of knowledge, lack of training, lack of understanding. So actually it covers both and understands both. But that's part of the uh, wider diocesan risk register that went to the Board of Finance, if memory serves me right, Derek. Yes, he said it. <laughs> Thank you. Glenn. Alan, this is not a question, it's more of a, a plea. Um, some years ago, the Social Responsibility Forum had a couple of things brought to our attention. And we wanted to um, do a little, a little research. We were obstructed. We had to conclude at that time that the Church of England still operates under a cloak of, under a cloak of secrecy. Our experience was that the National Safeguarding Team would only say to us, the policies are on the website. Y yes, but we'd like to just ask how this the policies are on the website. And that came from the top of the NST, but also from the bishop that held the brief at that time. Um, so we had to draw that conclusion. This is not a personal criticism. The other thing we noticed from the NST at that time was that there was a disproportionate amount of former police officers. Um, this is not the social forum, not social... Um, forum saying this, this is me. Um, police officers, uh, former police officers, police officers are good at catching and convicting. And sometimes the means justifies the end, which is not always a good thing. My plea from all that is that you work with us horizontally and not in a vertical model. And I'm sure that's how it will be. But I just want to emphasise that we need to we need to work together in that. I can't explain why there's lots of police officers at the NST. But, in terms of working, I think partnership working is the right way forward. Because yes, there's a times when arrests are entirely appropriate. And that is something that I used to do. But when you look at safeguarding, Prevention is more important. So if you can prevent somebody becoming a victim, you might also be stopping somebody becoming a perpetrator. And if you can stop that person becoming a perpetrator, that's got to be the right outcome. Okay? Because if we can stop something from taking place, that's right. So I know that there are certain elements that need partnership approaches to prevent that. So whether or not it's around education, whether or not it's around health, whether or not it's in another agency to take on an individual's needs. That's the way it needs to be done. And I think partnership is the only way. So that's why my view would be, yes, let's work together as the chair of DSAP, working with parishes and our partners on DSAP to make sure we have the right like representation from health, from the local authority, from probation service, from police. And then we could draw on everybody's experience to find out which is the right way to make sure that the policy and practice and the delivery of safeguarding across the Diocese of Carlisle is right and it's fit and it's for purpose. If that gives you that reassurance. But that is my view and certainly for the last six, eight years of policing, that is where very much where I was driven for from that partnership approach. I think I'd also <clears throat> want to say that um, we 
the various values that I think I, 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 want, I, that I have in this area of work, one of which is transparency within the limits of kind of legal transparency and moral transparency, so that we, we always make sure that, that, that we're not trying to defend the institution in whatever way, simply because we're trying to defend the institution, but because we want to get it right. Um, and also that we are accountable, and that, 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 that there is some sort of, that there's an external accountability scrutiny of what we've done and decisions that we've made. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think we need to fear that. And I wonder whether in the past we often have been fearful of something, that we, which in fact would have been helpful to us and most importantly helpful to people we were working with. So that's the value I would place on that. Um, Chris, can I make this the last, um, last comment? Yeah. Then we'll yes, on. just briefly. Um, last weekend I was at a conference of the RSMA chairs, and for the second year in succession, one of the main items was on safeguarding. And we had the director of the National Safeguarding Team there, and together with the, uh, the deputy. And I have to say, with our experience with them now is that they really are open and they like to discuss things. Um, one can learn a great deal about them. And also I think now the predominant culture has actually come from uh, social services. Um, the people I think at the top of the team are primarily social workers with tremendous experience. Um, so I think we have less to fear now than we might have done once upon a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, and thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're, we're about to have the move into uh, the building strategy, but I, I'd, I'd like to give us uh, three minutes to sort of stand up and stretch your legs, and then, uh, and then we can move on to that. We, uh, we move now to uh, bonus strategy, which I will hand over to, uh, to, to Richard to lead. But on behalf of us all, I want to welcome um, Reverend Canon Flora Winfield, who is the third Estates Commissioner, uh, who will be speaking to us. Um, for I hope you don't mind, I'd I, I, I like, I like to claim you as one of our own. <laughs> I don't know where you're, where you're home diocese. So uh, it's, it's, it's good to welcome you home. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and Richard, may I pass it on, pass it on to you? Thank you. Um, I want to begin with two anecdotes. So the first one is from uh, probably about 2011. Archdeacon Kevin Roberts and I were um, doing some stuff around, there was a building survey done that year, published in 2012, by the Church's Trust for Cumbria. And um, of course we all know what precious and special places our churches can be, but in this particular situation, I'm not going to tell you who it was or where they came from, but anyway, um, we were, we, we were, there was a, there's been surveys done of every church building in the county, and then we got people to come in, you may remember it, and we went through the surveys with them to ask, did they recognise that picture? And this particular person was almost in tears as she talked about the burden of the church building, how much there was to do, the shortage of money, shortage of people, and her recognition that actually this particular church building wasn't especially special, had come to the end of its life. And we said, so if somebody said you could close it, and the relief on her face was palpable. So that's the first anecdote. The second anecdote is this. In one of our towns, there were two churches opposite each other. They were both non-conformists, actually. Um, but anyway, uh, they both had quite a substantial church building and a hall behind. And they did literally face each other across the street. As money got tight for them, they both sold off their halls so that they were, and they did some conversion work inside the churches 
in order to create a more flexible space. And the decline continued, and they decided that they would kind of coalesce into one building and sell the other one. But of course, they'd lost the hall, and they got what I think can only be described as a bodged conversion inside. So the point about the first anecdote is to say, buildings are wonderful, they're wonderful opportunities, they're very special, they proclaim the presence of God all day, every day. But they can be a huge burden, and sometimes we need to lift that burden. And the point of the second anecdote, of course, is to say, that we need to be strategic and to talk to each other, because otherwise we end up with solutions that are actually the worst of all possible worlds. So, the building strategy. We're going to take this in two bits, Chris and me. Um, the first one is I'm going to talk about the building strategy generally for just a very, very short time. And then Chris is going to introduce a specific motion that we want Synod to agree. And then at that point, the building strategy will be more or less complete for now. Uh, so, talking about the building strategy generally for a moment. The, you can look at the whole long document. I printed it out in a little booklet in very small type, um, which I can just about see. It's 24 <laughs> pages, and that was in, your, in the papers. Um, but there's, there was an executive summary, which was headed Executive Summary and Philosophy, for those of you who looked at it. I, by the way, may I apologise about all the version numbers? I have been looking after the building strategy since George Howe stopped being an archdeacon. I was supposed to have it in the brief period between him and his successor, and I've been left holding the baby. I have done more versions of it than... Probably I've had birthdays, frankly. <laughs> and um, they have got out of sync. There's no two ways about it. So apologies about that, but you have got the correct papers. So, the point is that we want our buildings to be as wonderful as we can, to have the right number of fit-for-purpose church buildings in the right locations, as near as we can get, so that we can do the God-for-all strategy. So, we, the, way, the route to that is for churches, for mission communities, to have local buildings plans. It's no good people like me and the other archdeacons drawing up buildings plans, you know, a bit like the war room on Downing Street and people pushing battalions across the board. I've always wanted to do that. But um, that's not, that's not going to work, is it? Because we don't have that knowledge. And if we write them, you'll all say, it's top down. So we're not doing that. It's up to you, the mission communities of the diocese, to write your local building plans. The archdeacons representing the county will want to be a voice, but no more than that. And the point about a local building plan, the first iteration of it might be very simple. It might say, we've got six buildings or 20 buildings or whatever it is in our mission community and a brief description of them and then we begin to think. And then the next iteration might say that St Agatha's is just great, it's as good as it possibly could be. But St Benedict's needs some investment. That St... Uh, Catherine, no, um, St. Think of a C that um, sorry, St. Clement. Yes, we haven't got Clement in the diocese, have we? St. Clement, um, actually, we're going to use it much less. It's going to, we, we don't like the term festival churches because it's a complete 1984, isn't it? You wouldn't have your main for Easter services or Christmas services in St. Clement's because actually it's in the middle of a field. But it's a lovely church, it's great to go there on a summer Sunday and have an evening song or something like that. So we've used it a bit less. And then maybe St. Dennis, actually, it's got to go. It's, it's semi derelict, it hasn't had service in for ages, and that's it. And those were the rough four categories. But there's more that you could do, of course, there's lots of flexibility. And you would gradually develop those, because it's quite hard for the congregation of St. Dennis, who've worked so hard and loved it, to recognise that that's the case. 
So you come at it gently, you do iterate these plans until you've arrived at something that's a bit, got a bit of depth to it and a bit of oomph to it. <coughs> and we're going to help you do it because it's a jolly difficult conversation. So the Archdeacons and the Strategic Development Officers will help, Churches Trust the Cumbria will help, and the DAC will help. And there are some pathways to help do that, particularly towards the hibernating seasonal churches, and also to break that cycle of, we want to do something, so we need to get a grant, but we need plans to get a grant, but we need money to get the plans. So the Parish Property Fund has some money in and you can apply for grants to help do that, to do the kind of development work, to pay an architect to work with you to do some plans. So there's some pathways, some support. There are huge risks if we get it wrong. Because we all know, and you know too, that if your boiler blows up, you are not going to sacrifice the boiler for the parish offer. You're going to sacrifice the parish offer for the boiler. And we see it again and again. So there are huge risks. And of course the other big risk is that we lose a church that's really worth holding on to. And hold on to a church that's not quite the right building and not in the right place. Simply, for example, because of the vagaries of legacies. So I'll use, end with one final anecdote, which is that a church in our diocese had been, it had not had services for, I think, six or seven years because the ceiling was falling down. And in fact, I was nearly hurt very badly by a very large lump of plaster falling just while I was doing an inspection of the church as an archdeacon's visitation. It was two weeks away from proper closure with a scheme by the commissioners, and it got a legacy of one and a half million, which they don't, to be honest, know how to spend. So we end up with really bad decisions if we're not strategic. So that is the building strategy. I'm going to stop. Morning, everyone. Uh, so, uh, I think we've probably just heard that uh, local building plans are really at the core of the business of the building strategy. Um, the proposal before you today outlines the role of a number of stakeholders in relation to those plans. The proposal has received the support of the Bishops' Council, and so we're now bringing it to Darson Synod for <coughs> your approval and endorsement. So, by way of background, um, the, each mission community is expected to draw up a local buildings plan and it applies to the totality of an individual mission community. So it lists the buildings it needs for its work, so both mission and, and ministry, which it can afford to support in time, energy and money. And for each building it should give an indication of the level of maintenance and investment that the building might receive. Um, that local building's plan needs to be seen as a living document. Even once agreed, it may need to be updated to reflect a changing context. So, as part of the work today, consideration had been given to the part that the Darson Advisory Committee, the DAC, <coughs> might play in balancing applications for faculty against those local plans. But this proposal looks more widely at the involvement of a number of stakeholders including refining the role of the DAC. In particular, attempts to ensure that the roles played by those individual bodies fit what their remit is, because most of those bodies are actually governed by law. So, just looking briefly, because we don't have much time, um, at what the roles are um, with respect to those various stakeholders. So, looking first at mission communities, there's a duty on them as part of the building strategy to draw up and maintain the local buildings plan. So effectively that duty rests primarily on the mission community leader <coughs> but in consultation with the Archdeacon. When that local plan is at a suitable stage of development, it's 
it's got some tea, um, then the DOC will be consulted on that plan. And that's primarily looking at any concerns on its possible impact on listed buildings, because a significant part of the rationale behind the DAC is the care of listed buildings and the part that's played as a result of our exemption from normal planning law from the statutory system. And any concerns raised by the DAC will either need to be addressed by the mission community and changes agreed to the plan, or those details just need to be appended to the plan because we don't want them forgotten. Uh, after that consultation, the uh, local plan will be passed by the Archdeacon to the appropriate Archdeacon Read Mission and Pastoral Committee. Um, the committee will be particularly tasked with considering how well the plan moves forward the mission of the church in the area covered by the mission community. And approval of the plan will really be based on the general duties that are placed on that committee by the mission and pastoral measure. Um, so things like its duty to have regard for the financial implications and its duty to maintain an overview of matters relating to church buildings in the diocese and their use. That's on matters other than those which are dealt with by the DAC or the Ancestry Court. So it's really looking at how it drives the mission of the church in that area, whereas the DAC is primarily concerned with individual churches and their use in ministry. And that local plan, as it evolves, will be a continuing reference point for the committee. It will come back to them as necessary. So it actually fits fairly naturally, nat naturally with the functions that they already perform. Now, the Archdeacons clearly have a pivotal role in relation to those local building plans, both in terms of their development and adoption, um, and how they influence the processes that focus on our buildings. So that role includes working with the mission community in the development of the local plan, liaising with the DAC on the impact of the plan, uh, particularly in terms of its potential impact on listed buildings, and liaising with the Mission and Pastoral Committee on the content of the local plan's impact, because they actually chair those, the, those committees. But also being the key proponent to the DAC, and as necessary to the Chancellor of the Diocese, on how the proposed works either are consonant with the local plan or uncounter to it, and whether they fully support the statement of need that accompanies. Um, in the case that the Archdeacon has recommended against a proposal being considered by the DAC, or if there's no agreed local plan, the Archdeacon has requested consideration be deferred until there is, then whether or not the DAC is recommended in favour, the Archdeacon or indeed the Bishop may object to the grant of a faculty. Um, so that is the essence of the proposal we're putting forward to you. So it's the roles of the, uh, the mission community, the DAC, the mission and pastoral committee, and the archdeacons. And so Dyson Synod asked to endorse the building strategy, and particularly the proposals contained in the paper that's before you this morning. Thank you. So just two things very, very quickly before we sort of open it up, if that's okay. Or debate. Um, the first one is that you've got the precise proposal that's in front of you to, to agree. It's in paper on your table, uh, in, in your place. It's headed, um, it's the stable one, local building plans in operation. And um, the second thing to say is that not only has it been agreed by Bishop's Council, but it's also um, been signed off by the DAC, who had had significant concerns about earlier versions, but have been happy with this one. And by our chancellors, um, both the, uh, James, our chancellor, and Richard, our deputy chancellor, are very uh, are comfortable with this. So, uh, 
happy to open up to debate either about the specifics of what the proposal in front of you now that you're going to vote on in a bit, or about the building strategy generally. Um, looking at the stakeholders and, and the procedures that you've talked about, um, this seems to be very much Anglican. It okay. is, because this is an Anglican diocesan synod and we can only pass it for Anglicans. Yeah. But, in terms of our ecumenical partners, the, the building strategy itself, the thick document, is much more ecumenical. Right. It doesn't contain all this detail, or where it does, it contains it and says Anglican. And our ecumenical partners, not so much the Salvation Army, but certainly the URC and the Methodists, have agreed that they will follow their parallel processes in, the, in, you know, in a parallel way. In a parallel way. I'm just, as a mission community leader, I'm just trying to work out what it actually means to come up with a strategy. Uh, well, supposing, supposing that you've, you've got a local buildings plan and you've described your, your buildings uh, Agatha, Benedict, Clement and Dennis, and um, Methodist, we're on E, aren't we? Um, <laughs> Ethelberg, yes. Yeah. Uh, and URC, Fry's White. Um, so, uh, if Ethelberg um, wished to do something because they got some money, that was out with the, the, the shape of the local buildings plan, we, our understanding is that the URC or Methodist authorities would say, well, you, you know, how does that fit with the local buildings plan? No, you can't do it. Or you shouldn't do it. So they would stick to the same rules as us, that the buildings plan is what we're going to do in that mission community. So obviously they would have a, a role in drawing it up, you know, so they, they would have, it's not as if, it's not that, you know, you sit there and draw it up for the Methodists and URC, they're involved in the discussions, it's when they, it suddenly suits them, whichever church it is, because they've got a big legacy, not to stick to the plan. It's a bit like the Pirates of the Caribbean, isn't it? Stick to the plan. Maddie Lee Simpson, Alston, and I've got all sorts of questions. I presume I've permitted one, or should I just reel off the three? Oh. Let, me, let me pose them and you can decide. So, firstly, whose responsibility is it to do this work where churches are in vacancy and have no functioning PCC? Secondly, do you have a template buildings plan for us to follow? And three, you mentioned financial need. How do we discern financial need due to real poverty? So that there's, you need to do some, you know, you want to invest time, energy, maybe money into a given area, and decline or spiritual atrophy at the hands of a given, I don't know, it could be wherever you want to pin the blame, the PCC, the Rev, the congregation. So, so in other words, the stakeholders, people might want to cling to their thing because, you know, they might want to cling to their th But how, how are you supposed to discern, as a mission community together, what to do with the buildings when, when the stakeholders have a stake? And financial need might mean, well, we can't afford to resource our buildings, so we need outside help, but you can't afford because your congregation is atrophying for, for various reasons. You know, okay. how, do you, how do you pay attention to all those different... Right. Well, it doesn't seem to me that that's any different from having to do it as an incumbent, for example. Um, you know, as an incumbent, you would be faced with scarce resources. Um, you're faced with, you know, varying degrees of spiritual health within the congregations. And you're, you're kind of attempting, particularly if you're in a multi-parish benefice, to, to, to juggle the vision of what the overall thing will look like and your energy to, to invest in those different churches against, you know, the, 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 the potential and all of that stuff. Um, so I don't think it's, it doesn't feel to me as though it's any different from, from what, what we do as incumbents, really. Um, 
the point, I, I mean, in terms of what are doing for churches in vacancy, um, I mean, if there's nobody there at all who's a stakeholder from that church, then you will have to have a discussion without anybody there from that church, won't you? But, but in that case, it's probably on the verge of closure anyway, in which case the decision has to be made to close it. Um, but the idea that you wouldn't involve the stakeholders because they're stakeholders seems to me to be bizarre. That's precisely what we do want to do, is to... Is that not what you said? No, it's just how do you make a decision as a mission community? How do you make decisions when you've got all these different... Right, but that's no different from, for example, running the, the ministry offer system, where everybody wants to minimise the amount of money they put in the offer. I mean, that's a bit of an over exaggeration, is it? Because people are very generous. But there's still that balancing of, you know, the different churches within the mission community balancing the amount they want to offer against what the aspiration is to pay the costs. So it is a difficult conversation. Without a doubt, it's an extremely difficult conversation. But it's no different from the, the conversation we already have to have about ministry offer. It's difficult, and people don't really want it. But if we don't have it, then we'll have nothing. Um, Maddie, do you want to come? Do, do you want to follow up? Or? Um, no, I, th I thank you, Richard. I think that's fair. I'm just, I'm just anticipating how this looks when you've got. I'm, I'm quite a pragmatic person, but you're wanting to care for people and yes. you're wanting to do right by them, and they cherish their local building. But you're saying this is just a sap on resources on top of. You know, there's all sorry. There's all sorts of ways in which. Um, local clergy, for instance, are going to be the big bad wolf, and, and, and that's going to absolutely oh, get, you know, undermine the mission and the work that we're doing. You know what I mean? Because of the building. You're absolutely How do you right. Avoid that? You're absolutely right that we we will. It is going to be a very difficult conversation, and we will end up being very torn. I don't see this as something that will be instantly okay in the next. You know, that by the end of 2025, we'll have it all in place. I think that, that for lots of mission this is. The, the, the building plan will actually be quite quite thin. It will take a lot of time and conversation and building of trust to develop it, as it would in a multi-parish benefice with one vicar, where you've got to say, you know, I'm actually going to put my resources into this place because there's stuff happening and there's potential, and I'm, I'm actually going to put less into this. I'll let it chug along. It's it's really, take some time. But the other thing is just to say that the Archdeacons and Churches Trust and Cumbria and the DAC will support the mission community leaders and clergy doing that. So you're not on your own with it. It is going to be very, very difficult. But if we don't do it, it'll be worse. Chris, uh, is, is, it, sorry, is this about for yes. okay. And I think actually one key thing is that it's worth churches coming together to talk about it okay. together. Because I think you'll find lots of support from areas you don't necessarily expect it. And I think wonderful then things can then start happening. So we just need to let the spirit at work and to support each other. And that's one of the things that's really behind mission communities. Thanks, Chris. Can I have Kathy? I've got a practical question. If you've got a church that is um, has got a faculty um, for quite a large amount of work in the next six months, is it worth doing that, or do we have to wait until we have a mission community plan? Right, so the, the, the very short answer is that you put your faculty in, and because I mean, we're, we're hoping that we agree this today, you can't, you know, you can't hold up urgent work for you know, developing a local buildings plan, but it might, you might actually want to say, oh, let's start work on a local buildings plan as well, and do the two in parallel. And, and I mean, we did have a church, not too long ago, well, it was a few years ago actually, that wanted to spend a lot of money on basically what, I, in my opinion, felt like gold-plated taps in the loos. It was very glossy, because they'd got money, they'd had a legacy. But I knew, that their archdeacon, who wasn't present at the particular meeting, had actually was in active conversation for this building to be closed and sold to another denomination. It was insane to do it, really, but we ended up giving permission. So you can see why there's a there needs to be a kind of genuine discipline amongst ourselves about what we do given the future of the building. But you, 
it's going to be it's going to be a gentle and growing process, not a slam. There it is. Okay. The quick um, answer is talk to your archdeacon. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I've seen I've seen the questions. James is next, I think. Can we um, can we can just um, looking at time? Can we make sure we, we just keep the um, responses quick as well? Uh, thank you. I'm mission community leader and uh, a team rector for a mission community and team which has six church buildings serving five distinct communities. The community which has two church buildings has them in the wrong place. Um, all the church buildings are listed. One of them is grade one listed and needs oh, you know, 750,000 towards a million pounds to put the roof right, let alone anything else we might want to do to make the church more usable. And that happens to be the Great One listed building in the conservation area in the National Park. And you recognise, I recognise colleagues have similar situations. Two of the parishes, one has fewer than 100 residents, one has fewer than 200 residents. One of them is now thinking about becoming a festival church. We do use that term. Be, all right. That's what they say they're thinking about becoming. Even if you don't use the term, they're using the term. So I, you can come and talk to us about what we should use, but that's the term they are using. Yeah, well, they haven't seen that yet. They've been around for a long time, too. Yeah, I, 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 we can move off that particular point. So yeah. um, the question I want to ask is, because we are a team still forming, although we legally exist, and we're a mission community still forming. Uh, the resources for forming mission communities, let's just say, fell away at the time of COVID and are being reinstated. What resources will there be to support mission community leaders and incumbents in producing building plans? Because there's a big responsibility for difficult conversations, and I'm not clear in this building strategy what commitment there is to resourcing that from outside uh, and this falls into the class of things that I wasn't trained for at theological college. Okay, so I think I've already answered that, that we've said that the archdeacons will support, we've said that the Church of Strasbourg Cumbria will support, and we've said that the DAC will support, and the, you know, I, mean, I suppose it's also true that the Mission and Pastoral Committees would support. But there is no extra money because there is no extra money, James. I mean, if we don't have a building strategy, that won't change one iota of that, will it? No, but I suspect we're not providing the resources that we will need to achieve a building strategy. Well, I think, I, think, I mean, that may be true, but we can't magic money out of anywhere. And the fact is that we've got... I've described a very gentle process which will at least try to take a strategic look at, what the, at the problems you're facing. And I think that, as Chris has already said, coming together to do that will be a help and a step. It won't solve all the problems, but it will be a help and a step, and there are people to help do that, and that's probably the most important thing to offer of all. And, and as I wonder if set myself, we might learn as we go as well. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, Martin and then Susie. You're first. Oh, wait, okay. Um, and then Claire. Mine is a real mechanical quickie. Um, Richard, I'm confused in terms of numbers. Yeah. We're going to be asked to agree version 10. We've been given something yeah. like... Yeah, so it's, it's, those are all my faults. No, no, I'm just, I'm, is this version 10 that we've got in our hands? The one that you've got, the one with the staple in the top, that's called Local Building, Plan, building Plans and Operation, is, what you're, is that's what you're going to vote on? Building Strategy. This one with the staple, Susie. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Uh, two quick points, please. Uh, first of all, I hope that when the local business plan and building plans are being developed, we will also be aware of and uh, have dialogue with other denominations who are not partners in the mission community. I, where I, I live near Kirby Stephen, we have a very active Methodist community part of the mission community, but we also have Baptist and evangelical and the Quaker meeting house. We need to consider the, as it were, the Christian pattern in um, each area and uh, take account of it in the strategy. The second point, we recently had a presentation here on affordable housing. 
It may, and the local buildings plan will consider not just churches, but church halls and possibly other church properties. It's very important that we don't just see the pathway for the building that does not seem to have a future within the mission community uh, as something to be sold. It may be that there are other church purposes of high value, like affordable housing, which we heard a lot about last time, which could be the recipients of such buildings, and it would then be part of the wider mission to encourage their development. I hope the local buildings plans will have a wide view. Uh, one last point. There's a vast amount of data and information about buildings in Cumbria, as in all uh, counties. Some of it goes back to the days of Royal Commission on Historical Monuments. The Church's Trust for Cumbria has a lot of information. I'm sure that the DAC uh, has a lot of information. Is it possible that we could get a kind of dossier of agreed factual descriptive information about all, certainly all the churches, uh, so that there's no controversy over their relative historical or architectural or whatever background and the work of the local mission community in preparing an LDP uh, will be facilitated because there is a factual foundation which stands behind it, which can be drawn upon and quoted. So, dealing with the last one first, there have been two sets of building surveys. The one done in 2008 by an uh, architect from the North East, architects from the North East. We've got all their reports. Of course, it's a few years out of date, but it's not massively out of date. Certainly the Archdeacons have those, but actually all of the data was transferred to the um, Church Heritage Register, so it's online. Uh, that was a huge piece of work facilitated by Derek and um, some of your family a long time ago. So that's all safe there. And I mean, we can, I mean, we could actually probably put all of those, the PDFs for each church on the, on the website, in fact, or something like that. That would be up to date, wouldn't it? But... Anyway, there is, all the data is available. Um, middle one, wider use of buildings. Absolutely, of course, yes, it needs to, be, needs to be very imaginative. The only thing I'd say is that from the point of view of wider housing, for example, converting is always more expensive than building onto a brownfield site. Um, and finally, the wider thing, I mean, that's precisely why they need to be local building plans, because only in that local context with those local relationships can those buildings be included in. And they should be, as far as they're prepared to be, because they may want to stand back and not be, but let's hope they are. Thank you. Um, on, uh, so, Claire, did you want to ask? And Simon, I'm And then I think it would be good if we could move on. Yes, we need to give Flora about four hours. <laughs> I think technically I probably ought to ask the permission to speak, but since you've asked me. Well, that's right. I thought I was going to be permission, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, just a little bit of an ecumenical uh, thought on this. I've seen too many places where amalgamations of churches have ended up having or feeling they have to choose particular buildings. It's not been so much on legacies, which you've mentioned, but on listing and on graveyards, um, of which you have far more than we do. Um, and it, I guess the question is, if you've got a mission community where the Methodists have got the ideal building, but the Anglicans have got the history and, and the bodies. <laughs> How did you deal with it? Right, well, I mean, we, we had a situation like that in Carlisle where actually the Methodist building on Wigton Road is far better than the <coughs> Anglican one, which is now being sold. Um, I mean, you can close a church but keep the churchyard going. You can do that, and we do. So that might be a partial solution. But it does depend, because it's not easy to sell a Grade 1 listed building because there's a limited range of things you can do to it. But maybe what you do do is you kind of take it to be a hibernating or seasonal church, which is our diocesan preferred term, and I'm sure everybody will use that. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, that's that Simon lastly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just to... Uh, 
basic comments, I suppose. Um, obviously, those conversations about building strategy will be quite challenging in some mission communities because the mission communities might not be functioning very well as mission communities. So, so that's just a comment. And as for the other comment is, you know, is there anything we can do that once the church has been decided it's no longer required, that we can make sure that the process of getting rid of it is speeded up? Because I know it can often take, well, it seems to take years sometimes to get rid of churches that we've agreed we no longer require. Okay. To answer the, the, the first one first, um, yeah, difficult conversations. The only thing I'd say is that, as I've already said to, you know, in response to Maddie, the conversation about money are just as difficult. But I wonder whether we've shied away too much from having the difficult conversations in mission communities and whether actually having those difficult conversations would help us deepen our relationships and, and, and actually, you know, providing people are prepared to be really honest about stuff. And that's the trick, isn't it? So Charles Hope, for example, when um, a precursor of the current ministry offer system, got all the churches in their mission community to share their accounts. So they're all public, so they, you can ask to see them anyway, and they couldn't refuse. But they share their accounts, including the reserves, so that all the churches share their information. And they told the story as well, and it worked really, really well. But it, I think the point is, start having the difficult conversations and take them at a speed that's appropriate. But it's making the start that's the, that this requires. It doesn't say, well, they've all got to be done by, it's making the start. And I think it might help us deepen our relationships and, and so on. Um, the second one about speed of closing, of selling, disposing of closed oh, churches. I'm, I'm about that. Right, but it, quite a lot of it does depend on things like actually finding somebody to buy it, and then them actually <coughs> test when you test whether they whether they're doing the due diligence and so on, whether they've actually got the money. And we did have a case where one church was sold, and I, I we discovered because another church from another denomination was sold to a very similar organisation and it looked to me very much like money laundering. But the building had already been sold. And it then remained empty and semi-derelict for a decade and is only just now being rescued by a, a civic corporate body. So taking the care about who you're selling to is something that's quite tricky too. It doesn't apply to houses, does it? Because who's going to buy a housing record? But I might use it for money, but a church is more difficult. Do it, pubs. Yeah. <laughs> but I reckon that's it, folks. I think we should now very chat. Okay, right. Well, welcome. I, 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 I'm taking my, my guide from, um, from Richard. Do you want to vote on this now, or do you want to well, vote I on this? I think we'll do the votes at the end after we can do the Okay. It's worth hearing what Flora's got to say before we vote. Fine. Say, you know, it's rubbish, don't vote for it. Well, that's right. Well, in which case, I'm, I've taken my guidance from the Archdeacon of Carlisle. I'll turn, Flora, turn to you. Thank you very much. So, I'm conscious that time is now short, so I will uh, be more brief in my remarks than uh, I had originally uh, been asked to do. Thank you so much for the very kind and generous invitation to be with you, uh, and particularly thank you for meeting here today, rather than in, say, Workington or Barrow, as my home is just up the road. <laughs> and uh, three hearty cheers for you taking forward your building strategy, uh, which I'm looking forward very much to reading. We've been doing, because we're very sad people, we've been doing a piece of work on diocesan strategies. And one of my colleagues has read them all and analysed them all, and I'm here to tell you that only seven of them mention buildings. So you are really ahead of the curve on this question. Three cheers for Karma. <laughs> I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> so who am I? Uh, so I'm the third Church of States Commissioner. Probably almost nobody in this room knows what that means. I'm still not absolutely always sure about it myself. Uh, there are three of us, as the, new, as the numbering suggests. The first Church of States Commissioner serves the assets and financial investment role of the Church Commissioners. And probably when people think about the Church Commissioners, they think about we're the people who steward 
the historic <coughs> financial assets of the Church of England. So that's the first Church of States Commissioner. The second Church of States Commissioner is an MP who sits in the House of Commons and answers questions on the Church of England in the House of Commons once a month. You can see him on the Parliament Channel. I'm the third Church of States Commissioner and I do all the other things that the Church Commissioners are responsible for. So I chair the Mission Pastoral and Church Property Committee, which we're talking, whose business we're talking about today. I also chair the Bishopricks and Cathedrals Committee, which does what it says on the tin. I chair the Carbon Net Zero Programme Board for the Church of England, which I would also love to talk to you about, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, and uh, I chair the national events, the group which convenes the Church of England's national response on events of of national significance. So that means things like Operation London Bridge, the death of the sovereign, the coronation, and other big stuff. And most pertinently probably to this, alongside Mission and Pastoral, I also convene the Buildings Group, which brings together everybody who works at a national level on church and cathedral buildings to try and make that work more collaborative and more, more, more coordinated. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later. But also relevant to this, apart from the fact that my home is just up the road, is that I am married to a rural archdeacon. Jonathan Goff, who's the archdeacon of Richmond and Craven, who's, so his area is the western half of the Yorkshire Dales. So I live absolutely every day with the realities of rural church life, particularly in remote communities. I've been ordained for 35 years, and before that I was in lay ministry, and I've worked in three particular ecumenical contexts, and I'm very aware that in this diocese I'm in an intentionally ecumenical place. I've worked in local ecumenical partnerships, I've also been the National Ecumenical Officer for the Church of England, and I've served for 27 years as a Reserve Army Chaplain, and as a Parish Priest, and as a Humanitarian Diplomat. But much more importantly, let's start with Scripture. I want to just take you for a moment, I won't read the whole passage because we're short of time, but to, to Genesis and to chapter 28, and to Jacob on the move from Beersheba to Haran, in those desert places, and he reached a certain place and he stops for the night and he gets a stone and he uses it for a pillow. And you'll remember that he has a very powerful and strange dream which really marks the rest of his life where he sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder, and he sees the Lord above him. God speaks to him as he sees these angels ascending and descending. At the end of that experience, when he wakes in the morning, he thinks, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So I want to invite you in this conversation about our church buildings, which can be a very practical conversation and needs to be, to just take a moment to think about the place where you encounter God, especially the church building where you encounter God, your building. For me, it's a little parish church in Oxfordshire, a place I've known all my life, a place called UL near Wallingford. And in that place, Dame Alice Chaucer, who was the granddaughter of the poet, built a remarkably lovely small church, and alongside it, a village school and almshouses. And this is in the 15th century. This is cradle to grave care and response to the needs of that local community all those hundreds of years ago. And across the centuries, that church, those almshouses and that school have continued to serve that local community. They're still there today. It's still the village primary school, the oldest village primary school in England. And every church Every church building that you've just thought about in that moment is the place where Jacob's ladder touches the earth. So let's hold that in our minds as we think about all these practical and pragmatic questions around legislation and church buildings. 
So the Kendall Darcy Motion speaks of valued historic buildings, and these are places which have mattered and do matter to us and to communities and to people, and are therefore holy ground. They're holy because we pray and worship there, and we have done for centuries, and because we meet God in his house. And they're entrusted to us for a generation, both a privilege and a burden. And our world is complicated and sometimes overwhelming and fearful and full of conflict and people are longing for certainty. And these valued historic buildings can represent that, which is one of the reasons that they can become contested space, because people invest so much in them. But in the midst of all this, we are called to ask this question. What does it mean to be the people of God in this place? In my job working across the whole of the Church of England, I see that the dioceses are so variegated. Each one is distinct in its culture and its ethos and its assumptions of what constitutes normal, its ways of working, and each is like that because it's an expression of the life of God's people in this place, in their place. But we're all facing the same complex and demanding issues and shaping their response and their, to their circumstances. In the time since the pandemic, I think we've all become more urgently aware, not only of the privilege of the stewardship of these valued historic buildings, but also that they are a burden. And I've heard already in your conversation, and I know well from my own experience, the stories of exhausted volunteers, heroic efforts to support local communities which is, and, and in their care of their churches, which are so beloved. I know how hard it can be to recruit church wardens and church secretaries and treasurers and PCC members and safeguarding officers and all those people who fulfil that myriad of roles that we, through the governance and compliance burden, which we have now placed on local churches, require everyone to fulfil. So one of the things that we've been looking at, this is the first main thing I want to say to you today, from this perspective of all those who work on church buildings nationally, is how can we alleviate that governance and compliance burden in a way that's genuinely helpful to parishes, that doesn't prevent us from fulfilling the obligations that we have, but which enables us to be God's people in this place. Because my experience of rural church life is that it's not offering worship twice a month in our parish church, in our <coughs> local situation, in, across the benefice. It's not that that strangles the life out of local communities. It's trying to get all the governance and compliance stuff right and to populate all those roles with the right number of people who are able to fulfill them. So take that thought, how can we lift the burdens? And to try and work towards that, I've been convening a rather grandly named Buildings Summit, I, I didn't come up with the name I have to say, but this group, which is bringing together and providing a new focus for national collaboration for all those with responsibilities at national level for supporting good stewardship of our church buildings, especially our historic church buildings. And we've just begun and Chris can bear testimony to this because he was there, uh, a new process of conversation called Building Confidence. We, we literally began, began it at General Synod two weeks ago, Building Confidence, which is a conversation on church buildings across all the communities of the Church of England, an opportunity for listening and sharing with one another, focused on support to parishes and dioceses. So this is about how we better support parishes and dioceses. And it's in this context that I've been asked to update Synod on two particular areas of work in the National Church, among those building teams which support parishes and progress on the work of the Mission and Pastoral Measure Review. Some of you may be familiar with this lovely document which came to General Synod last July. And I want to highlight in what I'm saying to you today that we are working to alleviate some of those really difficult pressures on parishes that people have just been describing in practical solutions, in practical ways forward, to give you a repertoire of responses 
when things are difficult, so that you can concentrate on the work of sharing the good news and serving your communities in Jesus' name. Because we're a national established church, but for most people the church will be what is experienced locally. Something as simple as if the door is open at a local church building. And if that is a place where the hungry can find food and the thirsty the waters of eternal life. Where lonely people can find community and broken people can find comfort and healing in Jesus Christ. At the national level, the teams on church buildings and mission and pastoral are what in military situations we would call key enablers. They're not the people who are at the centre of the conversation. They're just there to make it work for, for you. You are at the centre of the picture. So our question is always, how can we best support you to be the people of God in this place? In faithful worship and witness, in pastoral care, in kindness, in selfless commitment to your communities. Being there with people at the beginning and end of their lives and at all the joyful and complicated bits in between. But because our churches are not only valued historic places, but are places of beauty, imagination and forgiveness. We all want the church to flourish and to have worshipping communities that are fit for purpose and which they can truly serve the places where they're set. Nobody wants to close church buildings. But we all know that there are moments where that very difficult decision has to be taken. So it's a good example, as I share with you, more information on progress on the review of the church of the mission and pastoral measure. It's a good example to take because it's not about closing more church buildings. It's about reaching the difficult decision that a building needs to close, that that's that point in its life cycle that's been reached with the local community so that they lead that decision. And so that that process, to which we've already heard reference, is less neuralgic for everyone easier to understand, more transparent, with proper consultation of the local community, but supporting those who are living the life in that parish to make sure that the decisions that we make together are more focused on mission and more pastoral, so that the mission and pastoral measure really lives up to its name. So the review of the Mission and Pastoral is work in progress. It's been underway for three years, and this, this outline document came to General Synod in July 2023, and I'm pleased to say it was very warmly received. And I think that was because it was the result of a very clear, careful and extensive process of consultation and listening, and an intentional search for consensus around the changes that were necessary to the measure. The original measure was introduced in 1969, and there have been updates since then, but um, much more work was needed to make sure that it was really fit for purpose to serve us now. We're on track to bring draft legislation to Synod for first consideration in July 2024, and then we hope that the process will continue through the various synodical and parliamentary procedures, and we hope that implementation will begin in 2027. So it's not quick, but it's not very slow either. And the mission and pastoral measure is that process through which we can take decisions about how we respond to changing contexts. Changing context in ministry, changing context pastorally, and changing contexts with buildings. The consultation we therefore have undertaken has been very much focused on those who've experienced the mission and pastoral measure in action before. Those who've been in a parish through a pastoral scheme, a scheme for reorganisation. We visited dozens and dozens of local situations where people had been through that process and had a careful um, series of listening exercises to their experience. We've also met Many archdeacons, thank you very much indeed, Archdeacon Stuart Fife from this diocese, who spent time with me to discuss how the, the right changes could be made. We've met diocesan mission and pastoral committees, deaneries, and all other interested parties. And we had a reference group from General Synod, of which Chris Angus 
was a member. Thank you, Chris, for your faithful membership of that group, which really helped us to shape the proposals in this document, which came from the grassroots. Everything that's in that document is there because people in parishes and deaneries and dioceses said to us, this is how this piece of legislation needs to be amended to work more effectively for us. So that when our context changes, and we need to make changes in pastoral provision, in ministry provision and in buildings provision, we can make change that's pastorally sensitive and appropriate, that's locally led, and that has a good strategic underpinning in the wider work of the diocese. So what have we tried to do in the proposals, which are now going to come back to General Synod in July? It's this, we have tried to design a spacious legal architecture which will provide enough room for future growth and development. Because what we've had before is, is not necessarily right for us now, and we, want, we don't want to set something up which works perfectly for now, but isn't adaptable enough for the life of the church in the future. We also heard from almost everyone we spoke to, and it was very striking, that we can have the right legal framework there and make something that's absolutely lovely and fit for purpose that everybody can agree on. But it's how, it's how we undertake the changes, how the changes are implemented, how changes in pastoral provision, in ministry provision, in buildings provision are developed and discussed and implemented at local level is how that's done in consultation and with respect for everyone that matters most. So what we've tried to do is to build an, in an intentional search for consensus a process which is more consultative and where everyone feels that they have agency and can be heard so that it's both more missionary and more pastoral. And what does that look like in practice? Processes in the legislation and set out in guidelines which are designed to be very transparent and easy to use because we recognise that what we have at the moment isn't terribly easy to use and isn't very transparent. Processes which people will be able to use in local situations which will be more transparent and give them a greater sense of agency with an emphasis for support on parishes, especially those which find themselves in difficult due to lack of resources either of money or of people. And also an emphasis on life cycle. And I'm fascinated by the conversation about not using the language of festival churches and using the language of hibernation cell because this is something which actually has, has fed into the work we've done on Mission of Pastoral directly from the experience of this diocese. We're trying to help people to think carefully through a range of options which are not binary, open or closed, but have more of an understanding of the life cycle of churches and knowing how to offer interventions before things reach a critical point and make it easier for parishes to understand how and who they can ask for help when things are a bit tough. So the new measure will offer a repertoire of options to ensure that people have choices which are more subtle and more responsive to the needs of their local situation rather than being open or being closed. And when we do need to close the church, when local, local decisions are made, that that's what needs to happen, that sad eventuality. We're introducing more transparent processes there too, and a new online system, which I realise is not, probably not words that make everybody's heart sing. But those of you who don't with the online faculty system will be familiar with a system where you can actually track the progress of the thing you're asking <coughs> online and see where it's got to. We'll have that kind of system. We've learned the lessons of how the faculty system's been implemented. I'm hoping what we'll have will be easier to use, but what will, most importantly, if you'll be able to see the progress of your piece of business through the work of the Mission and Pastoral Committee. And let's keep coming back to what do we, what do we want to achieve. Buildings which are the place for the church in that community where the door can be opened in every sense and people can feel welcome. I'm just going to skip over some bits. 
So let's come to a quick update on national work on church buildings, which I was also asked to offer you today. We've got two really excellent bishops who now lead on church buildings. Bishop Vivian Fall, the Bishop of Bristol, who leads in the Lords, and Bishop of Ramsbury, Andrew Rumsey, uh, who, take between them, have brought an enormous wealth of expertise and enthusiasm and helped me to re-energise this national conversation about the future of our historic church buildings. And we work really closely across all those people who are responsible for church buildings, council, uh, the cathedral's fabric commission and so on. We work really closely together. And I can genuinely say that on our valued historic buildings, we could not be in a more collaborative situation now. And it's, we've moved forward enormously on relationships with people like Historic England and National Churches Trust, the Diocesan and County Trusts, which are so important, the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and the Community Fund and so on. And just last week, I had a meeting with government minister, together with colleagues, where we continually put in the case, a new funding case to government, and we are receiving a warm reception. We are also talking now in a rather embryonic, but nevertheless, uh, we're making progress uh, in, in a new way to those who may be in government in the future. So please know that we are keeping faith with you on a really serious and intentional conversation with government about the responsibility that they have to these local situations where we're looking forward, looking between us, where we're caring between us for 16,000 churches, which is 45% of the nation's grade one listed buildings. Government has an interest in us getting this right. So just very quickly, one or two bits of financial information. I know that in this diocese you're familiar with the Buildings for Mission Fund, £11 million of new money, and the Sustainability Net Zero money, which is £30 million in this triennium. And the new building, church building support officers appointing under Buildings for Mission, now in 35 dioceses, to support parishes in their care of buildings and in minor repairs and improvement fund spends to make sure that that's used really well. There's plenty more room for more funding in this area, and I'm really working very hard to make sure that we get it. But it's all about a practical focus on supporting parishes and dioceses to take that forward as well as we possibly can. I'm not going to talk about the net zero agenda now, but if anyone wants to talk to me about it afterwards, I'm very happy to do that. We have challenging times ahead. I think we're all very realistic about that. And every single one of us needs to be part of the answer to the question, what does it mean to be the people of God in this place? And I want to end by just taking you back to that place that you thought of at the beginning, that holy place where Jacob's ladder touches the earth for you. That place where the door is open and where anyone can come in and meet their Lord and Saviour. Whether in the ministry of that building as a sacrament in the landscape, or in the ministry of those people who serve that place in feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and providing the water of life to the thirsty. Those places where Jacob's ladder touches the ground. The parishes of the Church of England are part of the unique geography, both physical and spiritual, of this country. And our church buildings continue to be a sacramental sign of God's presence and of com the com our commitment to be a Christian presence in every community. And the work I've shared with you this morning is all about ensuring that we can keep faith with those who've gone before us and with those who undertake this enormous responsibility now of caring for these buildings so that together we can respond to the question, what does it mean to be the people of God in this place? Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, and also for uh, um, editing your, your 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 presentation so so expertly. I just particularly love the, the image of Jacob's ladder. I think that's a, a that's a fantastic thing for us to be reminded of. Richard, I'm going to hand back to you just to say that we uh, we are due to finish for lunch in, in a very few minutes. So the next thing, actually, 
who are doing some pretend to do some of lotion if they want to put it. And then we would kind of take the votes of everything. Um, so, uh, Anne. Yeah, I think our, our sort of motion was prepared um, probably a couple of years ago now, and it's taken a while to get to this point. And I think a lot of what we have heard today um, addresses the points that we wish to raise. Um, certainly the, the first, I have actually got a copy of it in front of me, on a printed out piece of paper. <coughs> yes, I think the first point um, was that we wanted the Bishop's Leadership Team to promote and support open discussion. And I think that's very much what the, the proposed local building plans is all about open discussion and as much support as the centre can possibly give to local people um, would be good. Sorry. <laughs> um, because they, they will be difficult conversations and you know from a clergy wellbeing point of view um, I think it's important um, not to leave the clergy unsupported in having those really awkward conversations in mission communities. And what we've heard from um, Flora um, was really interesting and obviously that nationally um, there's an awareness of the funding difficulties. Our deanery motion was originally sort of generated by the fact that, you know, 10 years ago if you needed a new roof you could get 80 or 90% funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund. That's not the case anymore. Um, but as if they are out there actively um, encouraging the government to face up to its responsibilities to play their part in funding care of our national heritage, then I think that probably addresses the second part of our, our motion. Um, so I think we're probably happy to, that these things have now already been taken forwards both on a local and a national level. And, um, and we withdraw our motion. Thank you. That's okay with the rest of the rest of Kendall agree who are here. Good. Excellent. And we can have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, Richard, do you want to um, propose your yeah, so strategy? Two last things. There's been a lot about the kind of implementation of the local building plans. Just to explain in case you hadn't noted. The idea is that we have identified, if you like, three waves. And the idea is that there'd be a first wave, a second wave, and a third wave. So we're not trying to do everywhere at once. And the second thing is, um, Flora very, you know, powerfully talked about Jacob's Ladder and this is none other than the house of God and so on, <coughs> and the gateway of heaven. The building thing, the, the, the long document, has another take on that, which is to think of your church as a home. Is it good enough? What does it feel like? Is it homely? Does it work? So that may be a helpful thing as well. Is the standards, is the quality good enough? So, with all of that said, I think I'd like to ask everybody to vote in favour of the stapled bit of paper. And if you do that, the implication is that you're voting in favour of the long document because that's been updated on the assumption that you are voting in favour of the stapled bit of paper. You're, of course, if you're, if you're not willing to vote in favour, you, we, we can have that too. <laughs> just have a due process. <laughs> so, um, we're, 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 so, we're moving to a vote, okay? Yeah, please, we, could we vote? Could, all those in favour of adopting this, uh, the building strategy, we need to form, give formal approval to it. Could I ask you to raise your hands, please? Okay, those uh, against? Any abstentions? One, okay. So, that's carried. that's carried. Richard, thank you. And thank you for, um, for, for keeping on going with it since, since George uh, handed it to you. you. Wonderful, okay. <laughs> In which case, it is time for lunch and we reconvene at half past one, please. We'll move on with the agenda. Um, just to let you know that I'm, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm swapping around two of the items this afternoon. Uh, the, uh, we're going to do 
the, the uh, item on living and love and faith that I'm presenting on will come first, and then we're going to do the uh, God for All um, item, and Rachel head speaking to us uh, after that. So we're going to swap those two items around. Um, but first of all, um, Christine Burgess, could you come and uh, speak to us about Rachel Justice? Actually, before, before you speak, can I come, can I keep, keep coming. Sorry, I, <laughs> sorry. I was just remembering something else that somebody had mentioned to me. Um, uh, thanks for that. It's your, uh, it's your birthday today. <laughs> so, uh, coming to Dallas and Synod, important and wonderful though it is, on your birthday is the work of super irrigation. Uh, we're going to sing. So we're going to we're going to treat you by singing happy birthday to you. So, so Anne's birthday. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anne. Happy birthday to you. Fantastic. Great. Christy. Thank you. Um, we need to become a diocese where UK minority ethnic people want to come to and belong to. At the moment, there are four of us in the Racial Justice Focus Group. I'm joined by Isaac Lawrence. Isaac was here this morning, but he probably had to go back. Uh, Emma Sainer Hay, Andrew, and Angie Burrell. Our terms of reference are data collection, how many UK minority ethnic clergy are there in our diocese, how many UK ME people are employed by the diocese, storytelling, what has been the experience of UK ME clergy and employees, employees and what can we learn, communications, if I am UK minority ethnic will I be attracted to the diocese through what I see on the website, and the fourth term of reference, um, Gypsy Roma Traveller Community, how can we support those who are Christians, who are part of that community, and the community of, as a whole? So, we would love it if you could join us in our group. So there are four of us in the Racial Justice Focus Group. Uh, we mostly meet on Zoom um, every few months, so it's, it's not onerous. Uh, but it would be great if there were some other voices and ideas in that group. So please speak to me um, or uh, email me, you don't know my email. Speak to me if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Chris. Just a quick question. Given that we're in ecumenical county, it would be nice to include our other denominations in there in terms of uh, ministers. Did you, did you pick that up? Those of you? Yep. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, the next item is uh, Bishop's Council, just to receive the report of the Bishop's Council from September. The Bishop's Council has met on a couple of occasions, at least since then, but um, we didn't manage to, to agree the minutes in time to circulate them for this meeting. So we only at the moment have have that the minutes from the, uh, the September meeting, but are we okay to receive those? I presume. Okay, good. Um, General Snod report. Um, Val and Chris, I think you're speaking to us. Includes things that happened last November. Um, so uh, it covers quite a bit of legislative business, uh, one of the things that General Synod is there for. What's been happening in terms of living in love and faith, um, safeguarding, and what's happening there. Um, there was quite a few, um, three items this time, which were really about bullying in codes of practice. Um, clergy pensions got 
uh, a significant mention. Um, also, removal of the divorce impediment to ordinations, well, not its complete removal. Um, a session on land and nature, what the church does with its land. Uh, another one on future of work, um, racial justice and transatlantic uh, chattel slavery. Um, a report from the Archbishop's Commission on Families and Households, on the state's evangelism, and more in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and challenges to international order. So we're not going to talk through those now, um, but what we're happy to do is answer any questions you might have about what happened and is happening. Happy to look at uh, Tudor. Uh, just a quick question uh, on the um, living long faith uh, section. Is the last sentence uh, there? It says, uh, of the last two sentences, after live debate, a motion to move to next business was passed by a substantial majority. In essence, the work can proceed without a specific vote in favour, but with members having heard, been heard. Um, just from the commentary I heard, it was suggested that um, the motion itself, therefore, wasn't received, uh, and therefore uh, it wasn't uh, rejected, but nor was it supported. Uh, and so the work from previous beforehand can continue, but they need to bring things back differently. Is that a correct interpretation? Shooter, thank you very much. Um, it, it, the, uh, the motion to move to next, next business is a rather odd thing in, in, in synod uh, terms. It happens very occasionally, and in fact, I think it's the first time I've seen it pass. Uh, what it effectively means is that you cannot bring back a motion in the same or substantially the same terms within the lifetime of the Quinquennium without uh, the consent of the business committee. Um, so uh, it does mean that we can't bring back that, uh, that, that particular motion in the same terms. Uh, having said that, of course, um, uh, uh, the motion itself was uh, uh, to a large extent about how we process the work going forward, the, the, the outcome of the, the resolution that we'd already voted on in November. Um, uh, so so the, the prayers of love and faith still require some work, particularly the standalone uh, services. Uh, that's already the subject of the General Senate so of Resolution. That work must continue um, uh, regardless of the, the, the motion that was put before us in February. Um, I, I think in essence what, we, um, what, what the Synod uh, was saying uh, was that um, the, uh, it, was, it, it was not appropriate at this particular time to commit to a process of reconciliation while there's still so much unresolved. Um, and um, one of the ironies was that the, the motion to pass the next business, which was basically saying we're not, in, we're, we're not agreeing to this reconciliation just now, was, a, was the point in the whole process when the Synod has been the most reconciled. <laughs> um, we overwhelmingly agreed that we weren't doing that. And it was also the first time on the floor of Synod where I think genuinely people were trying to articulate care for and the opinions of people on the other side of the question. Um, so it was one of the most heartwarming <laughs> um, debates that, I, that I've seen on this particular issue. So we can't bring back that particular motion. Uh, we wouldn't want to. I think also there was perhaps a sort of subtext, well in fact there was more than subtext because it was mentioned in speeches, that people weren't particularly interested in a reconciliation process that was led by the bishops that actually the Church of England is more than capable of working out its own reconciliation process, and much of it depends on how things go from here, uh, the unresolved questions. Um, but our reconciliation is demonstrated by the fact that we're all still here, we're all still in the room, we're all still busy in our parishes, we're all still busy working for the Kingdom of God, and we're still talking. Um, as, uh, as a minister, I don't have a first class degree in typos, but um, in the presidential address, where it says, it, sorry, where it says in the presidential address, um, it models an alternative way, is that meant to be the pattern of the Christ life, or is it pattern? 
I'll take it back to the world spot. I have to say it was my job to write the report this time and I was laid back and had a lot of commitments and Chris picked it up at the last minute and it was a brilliant job so yeah, okay. a lot to thank him for. I have found first in Any other questions for our synod reps? Yes, please. Can I just mention fringe meetings because they don't list, they're not listed on the agenda but they are very valuable. Um, there was an excellent one by the Environment Group uh, and a wonderful talk by uh, Ruth Valerio and uh, that's been recorded so if you're interested in a really good theological and environmental talk please uh, get in touch and we'll make sure you can access it. Uh, there was an introduction to Thy Kingdom Come materials, the launch of those, and there's an excellent selection for Thy Kingdom Come this year, so um, do look for those when, they, uh, when they're publicised. And I probably will anyway mention, um, we always have a fringe meeting for our Carlisle Diocesan Motion on Israel and Palestine, on Carus Palestine. Um, we had a wonderful uh, session chaired ably by Stuart um, with a... Um, with Daniel Manea of Musalaha in Jerusalem uh, talking about the current situation for Christians and um, Tariq Shururu, who is the um, Director of Lawyers for Palestinian Human Rights. Um, so Daniel introduced the session, uh, Tariq responded from a, from a legal viewpoint and obviously with the um, International Court of Justice and so on, uh, so a few comments there. Um, and it was it was a wonderful session, and um, I think moved things forward um, as we crawl towards the finish line of, of getting that debate debated in general synod. You know. Oh, um, Sean. Thank you. Just wanted to uh, just to say uh, because you may well be situating this to people in the parishes. Just on the back, where it talks about the removal of divorce impediment to ordinations, uh, most people probably know this, but it's probably worth just saying it out loud, that there isn't a, uh, it doesn't mean that if you're divorced, you cannot be ordained. There are just hoops to jump through. And I just wanted to make sure that people didn't, if this was situated to parishes, suddenly think that the Church of England won't uh, ordain those who are divorced. Thank you, it's an important point. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Great. We've uh, we've touched on the next item. I say we're going to now move to the. The item on living and love and faith, uh, which we've already touched on, um, and uh, I wanted to give you a basic brief update about where that's up to. But also, I've had a number of requests from people that that we really highlight both at Bishops' Council and uh, and to the Diocese Synod about that, that this is this is a very serious issue in the life of the church, and that. Um, what we mustn't do is to, in some way, kind of say, well, it doesn't affect us in Carlisle, when it very much does. Um, I should say that alongside um, having taken on, uh, been acting in the Diocese of Bishop uh, over, over the next, over two years, um, more of which in a moment, um, it, it is an interesting time to be leading and caring for a diocese. Um, during this during this time, and I am really grateful for your generosity and prayers, uh, and particularly around this particular issue about how 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 we how we go forward in a in a good way together through this particular challenge. And one of the reasons I wanted to swap these around is because this is an issue that is is really dividing people, is causing significant stress and worry. Um, for, for, for parishes, for clergy, for individuals. It's a, it, 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 
the, 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 it's a thing that's, that's really deeply held, which affects, also affects people very deeply for a variety of reasons. And so, what I thought we would do today is I would basically just talk about where we're at, and then I was going to give a, a, some time. Um, actually, not for a discussion, because I think I want to encourage that, that parishes and places where you haven't had a discussion yet, that I would encourage you to do that in such a way that people can feel that they are heard and listened to and people can say what they need to say. I know we, we, we have the Living, Love and Faith course. Some people have done that, some people have not. Um, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done something with this, perhaps to, to do that in this, this time. Um, the Synod debate, um, or some, what the process were at Synod, which was delayed uh, and put, put off by the by the motion that Miranda Thrall Fall Home from Liverpool put forward. The, the exact name of that sort of um, motion, I forget, um, was around some commitments and a new way of doing things that the Bishop of Leicester, who is the new lead bishop for, uh, for Living in Love and Faith, put forward. And um, his ambition, and that of Helen Ann Hartley, who had been the kind of co-person with him, was that somehow we had got into a state as a church where there was an awful lot of fighting. That people would stand up at synods and, and dismiss others. People from different perspectives. There was lots of, I'm, 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 forgive me if I said, I felt quite a lot of grandstanding from all sides going on. I, I, I now go to General Synod, I don't get to vote or speak, which is, which is uh, probably, probably a good thing. Uh, <laughs> But actually, a reset, um, some sort of set of saying, we profoundly disagree across the church on this issue. Some of us feel that this is uh, that where we've got to is, is is way too far. That we have rejected the faith in some way, the faith that we have that we have received, the teaching, the direct teaching of Scripture, and that that is something that we just cannot live with. For other people. Similarly, they would say, I read the Bible and I read that this is something we should do. They come at it from a, from a theological perspective, just as, as, as others feel this is a theological perspective. They are longing for the, the full embrace and inclusion, the, uh, the, the blessing of, uh, 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 of, um, of same-sex relationships. And they feel that without having done that, the church is continuing to exclude and to condemn people who, who we should be including and embracing and, and saying your life is, is as we, is, is, um, uh, is, 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 a, is a holy way of life. So we just need to recognise that these are very profound differences between us and that these are not easily reconciled either by a quick conversation or by simply saying well, we're just going to ignore this. And so I, I, what I wanted to say, as I said to the Bishop's Council the other week, is that as a church in this diocese, we do need to recognise that we have these deep divisions and that this will affect some of the way that we might be able to work together. That for some people, and it's from different sides, and I, and I hate using that phrase, but different angles on this debate, do not feel that we can agree to disagree. And that doesn't matter whether you are in favour of, 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 of the proposed changes or you are somebody who is against these changes. That for many people this is simply too far. This is, this is a matter which, which we can't just say, oh well we will disagree on this and move forward. And of course between those those two positions, those two positions are also pretty, pretty nuanced, aren't they? Those of us who hold different positions within that will also hold them with great nuance. It's very difficult to sum them up in a way that is fair or correct. But between those positions and in other ways, there are people who say, well actually, I hold this position, but I can agree to disagree. This is not a what is often called a first order issue. I said, for me this is a second order issue, and I can, I can agree to disagree. 
For other people, they simply say, actually, I just want to get on with things. I want to get on with things. I want to stop talking about this. This is something that we just need to kind of move on with. And so across our diocese, across our church families, there will, there will be all these different um, um, perspectives, approaches, and feelings which are very deeply held. So I think I, what I'm trying to say is that we need to recognise that, that as a synod. That amongst us there will be people for whom this is, this is a huge matter, matter of theology and justice, a huge matter of theology and scriptural faithfulness. Um, and that will take up some of our energy. It will affect, it will affect some, uh, some of the ways that we do things. And I hear from different perspectives, people who say, we're not sure what we can do next. There's, there are projects that we are planning, that we'd like to do, where we are, um, we're not sure whether we can do it because we don't know where the church is going to be in 12 months, 18 months. I guess I also want to say that whilst people know my own position, I, I want to value and respect those who hold a different position to me. And to say that as your bishop, I will respect and love and support you no matter what your position. That, is, that seems to be part, alongside one part of my role, there is this part of my role that is also in ministry, is also to, to love and cherish you. And that recognizing that, that, that each person has probably wrestled with scripture, wrestled with their, their conscience, and, and has come to the conclusion they have, not because they want to exclude people, not because they, they want to kind of ditch, the, uh, ditch, ditch um, Christ's teaching, but in good conscience, in prayerful wrestling. And I want to say that I do recognize and respect and honor that. And my, my delight and joy is still to support you. And because I know that although this is a major and important thing, there will also be other things that we disagree on. But we are family, even if we are struggling with some of that at the moment. So, I want to honour and respect and recognise the integrity of different positions on this. Um, I want us to be able to have these conversations in good heart, in good conscience. I want us to try and find the way through that says, actually, some things may need to change to be supportive of the work that's been done nationally in terms of working out how we move forward. Um, but to encourage each of us to be really aware of where each other stand and how deeply held and deeply troubling um, this can be for others. And, and for us not to pretend that that is not a thing that's affecting us here. And, but for us to pray, most of all, not, not, uh, and, and, and some of the, some of, some people I think have felt that when, when Bishop James and I said, please pray, that somehow we were saying, please be quiet, don't make a noise, don't make a fuss. I want to tell you that that is very far from the truth. And I'm sorry if we gave any impression of that, but rather that there are, we are in a moment where, where we do need to be able to speak to one another. We do need to be honest with one another, to recognise um, how, how difficult and deeply held our, our convictions are. But actually, we really need God. We really need God to work in us, to give us wisdom, to challenge us. And I say that not just to those who disagree with me, but to those who do agree with me. I want God to challenge me about the way that I do this, about the way that I speak about this, by the way I think about, the, about my, my, my church brothers and sisters. I want God to, to move and challenge me as much as I might be praying that he would work in the lives of others too. So the prayer 
is really for for us to for God to help us move forward through this in a way which honours our brothers and sisters, but most of all honours God. How might Christ, if he was if he was standing, if he was if he was giving this talk, if he was trying to introduce this item, how, how might he challenge us? And for that prayer to be for that, and that we then have the, the grace and the courage to, to do those things. So, let me encourage each place that if, if you've not enabled a conversation about this, a safe conversation for all view, viewpoints, because I also want to recognise that it doesn't matter where you stand on this issue, people are worried about saying that because they think they're either going to be called, either, they're either going to be called a, a bigot or a heretic. Well, let's not live like that. Let's not do that. But let's have that conversation that helps us to do that well. Let's recognise that this is difficult for us, really profoundly difficult, and, 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 and concerns matters of, of mission, of, 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 of identity, of, of, you know, of human, of hu human um, identity, of salvation, welcome, justice, theology, all these things. Let's recognise this. I would recognise the effect that, that this is having on our, this, this, this could be having on many of our churches, not all, because some churches just are quite happy to keep going through this and it doesn't affect them quite so much, but for others it's a big thing. You know, people thinking about leaving, people who have left, people who um, can't serve on governing bodies because they don't agree with the Church of England's position, all these sorts of things are alive and real. So pray for this. To pray that, that most of all, we would, we, that, that Christ would guide us through and help us to make decisions and arrangements and, and whatever it is that are the right thing. Pray for those whose responsi responsibility is, it is nationally to, to work these things out. So by stopping the, uh, the Synod motion, that has in fact put the work back and there's going to be work done over the coming months to come back with some commitments about, about what we do, how we do it, and trying to reset the conversation so that we're not just shouting at each other, but find a constructive way forward despite our differences. So to pray for, particularly pray for Martin Snow, the Bishop of Leicester, who's leading on it, because he really needs our prayers. So praying for those who are working through that. And as I say, the prayer in what we do and how we do it, that we will know Christ and that we will honour him in the way that we do it. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I am, as you know, I hope, always open to conversation, to, to, uh, to comment, to talking it through and, and, and working it through together. I'm, wherever, you're, wherever you stand on this, whatever your perspective, please know that I'm really keen to have conversations with you about it. I did think that perhaps it wouldn't be a, given that we've talked about the things before, um, the stuff that happens in Synod, that perhaps having a moment now to, for people to stand up and say what they think now might, might not necessarily be the most helpful thing. So instead what I'd like us to do is have a, have a time of silence. But not silence in our hearts and our heads, but rather a time of prayer. And then we, that, that, that is perhaps the thing that we can do as synod together, is, is in silence, that each one of us can pray. And say, pray for those things. Pray for the life of the church. Pray for our way through this. And pray that in, in as much as it depends on us, we might honour Christ. So can I ask you to, and ask synod to, 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 to just have a, a few minutes of, of silent prayer and, and, and to say also that, of course, our loving God takes honesty from us. So please be honest. Let's, let us be honest in our prayers. It's a moment of quiet, and I'll, 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 I'll conclude with a prayer.
Almighty God, we pray for this part of your church. We pray that you would guide us. We pray that you would give us grace. Grace for one another. You would help us to understand one another and to disagree well, to listen to one another and to speak lovingly to one another, even in our difference. We pray that you would guide us through this time and the steps that we take and the place that we get to would honour you most of all. We pray for those who are most worried, most affected in different ways by the current debate and disagreement. We pray for peace for them. We pray for those who take a lead particularly for Martin Snow and his team. And we pray for the bonds of fellowship and peace that bind this precious diocese together, that you would grow those bonds of peace and fellowship, even in disagreement. Not so that we would ignore the differences, not so that we would feel silent, but rather that through this we might know one another better, honour one another more, and find a way through. Lord, we offer all these prayers to you. Most of all, Lord, may the church in this place Honey, seek your kingdom in the world and live, speak, think in the way that honours you and our precious Saviour. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Thank you all. Um, we are we now um, to say that is not the end of that item, as it were. There are, there is, as, I've, as I've made clear, there is a long, long, long way to go, and there is. Um, um, please know that my door is open for conversation and to uh, to support you. We are going to move, though, for, the, for this afternoon on to the next item, um, God for All. And uh, it's really great to work, welcome Rachel Head, uh, who is uh, the new Director of Mission and Ministry Support and Innovation. Have you managed to get, have you managed to get that onto a business card yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, Rachel joined us at the beginning of, uh, of this year uh, in a post that's been funded by the Church Commissioners uh, to kind of lead the, uh, uh, the team uh, involved in, in ministry and mission and to help us to kind of focus the work of the different people that we've got uh, working in different areas, Nikki with development, ministry development, Richard and others in, in mission, mission and, and Rachel is, uh, is bringing that team together and it's been really great uh, to have her as part of the team a part of the Bishop Staff team over the, since the beginning of January and already feeling that there's lots of things that are moving on and being focused and uh, uh, I'm really feeling the benefit of Rachel being around which is, which is really great so thank you Rachel for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you in a minute um, so where we're up to last time I stood here in, in, uh, in October I talked about the Darst Investment Programme and we were going for a big bid for all sorts of things and um, 
But it became clear, I think, really during December, that despite the brilliant work that a number of, uh, of, of our colleagues had done to, uh, to draw up that bid and get it ready for submission to the National uh, Committee, that actually there was some <coughs> feedback and other things that was coming back, and I thought, I don't think that this is going to be successful. Uh, that, they, that they might give us a little bit of this plan, or this bit of money, but other bits will be rejected. And, and actually, especially after the non-appointment of the new Bishop of Carlisle, that was not something that really, as a diocese, we needed. Um, that what we needed was, was to, to, to know that the thing that we were putting in was going to fly. That the people that, they, that we knew that we were completely, as well, sure as you can be, that the thing that we were going to do was going to um, um, was going to be really gain the confidence of the committee, and that we knew what we were doing. We could tell a really compelling story about what we were trying to do, and, and actually we weren't quite there yet. And there were various conversations, particularly around church planting, where it felt like um, the. Uh, those who nationally look after that bit of the work were saying, oh, well, have you thought about this and have you thought about that? And um, I thought, oh, you, you, there's probably all sorts of other agendas going on here. So it just felt that we could have put something in, we would have been nervous about it, and then some of it would not have, uh, have been um, accepted and, 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 uh, and awarded money. So. We, I, I took the decision to pull that and, uh, and for us to spend the next um, months getting that, getting those plans properly in, in place. Plans for church planting, plans for the development of mission communities, and actually there's a, there was a lot of, of work on the ground we could do to get ready for, for a big bid, as well as actually getting on with the stuff itself. And, and I think that's the... Um, that's the that's a major thing that I want to kind of reassure you about, is that we are not treading water for the next 18 months. That there are a lot of things, a lot of things that we are, are going to, we're going to get on with. That, that actually the, the day-to-day -day life of mission and ministry in parishes is going to go on. We aren't treading water waiting for a new bishop, but rather that the plans we've got, the work that we are doing, well, as and when a new Bishop of Carlisle arrives, that they will get to join in with what we are already doing. So we move forward with confidence and faith, having courage to do new things, having the courage to, 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 to tackle and grasp the nettles, we move forward. We have though, since then, and the team who, who having worked really hard on the bid, did an amazing job in about three weeks of turning that round into a, into a different smaller, more focused bid for some capacity funding, which I hope you may have seen the news this week, that we received £600,000 um, towards our work. And that is a, so the, the work that we're, we're, we're going to focus on particularly, which will continue past um, the, the submission of a, of a larger bid next year, is uh, firstly uh, the appointment of the new Archdeacon of Carlisle. We are interviewing on Friday, so please pray for that appointment New Archdeacon of Carlisle. Um, uh, the Archdeacon of Carlisle, uh, as, as currently, will also be a strategic development officer, that is, the working with mission communities to encourage the development of mission communities. I, I will confess that I am slightly traditional in my view that says that no matter what, what great name we can give an Archdeacon, it is the role of an Archdeacon enables this work to happen. That actually, when you know your archdeacon, when your archdeacon knows the patch, when you've got this, uh, 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 um, that, that they know how to make the um, uh, the statutory functions of an archdeacon work to enable mission and ministry on the ground, we will see that change. So we are pray praying for somebody who, who, alongside the archdeacons that we currently have, um, will know their people, know the parishes. Be somebody who is trusted by church wardens and others and valued. And so that's a partnership for enabling the changes that we need to see in terms of, of mission communities and the mutual support of mission communities flourish. So one part of the bid was to fund uh, that post, which is, so we, we managed to have that. Uh, another part is to do with vocations. 
that felt to me like a piece of work that we couldn't wait for. That actually we needed to put some more resources into vocations. We've obviously got Nikki as Director of Administrative Development. We've got Peter as a, as a part-time DDO. But actually, if God is calling us to things, God will have given us the people and the resources to do it. So how? So, so this is so this this will be somebody who can help us kind of really focus on vocations, on the on the encouragement, the development, the training, and the release of the vocations of all God's people. And and that vocation, those vocations are not simply getting stuff done on a Sunday, but also that broader sense of vocation where each one of us. Um, some of us are called rather to, to, to build up the church, to build up others for the works of service, but most people are in fact, their vocation is in their workplace, as a scientist, as a town planner, as a cleaner, as a doctor, as a teacher, all those, uh, you know, a, 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 a local business owner, these are all vocations, these are all the places where we will live out and work out our mission and ministry. So the vocations work is not simply about how do we kind of grow the vocations to, to lead worship and to teach and to do, uh, lead home groups and um, do pastoral work, but that wider sense of vocation that, that, that each of us has because of, our, uh, because of our baptism. So vocations work and um, that sense of growing our own in every way. And then also church planting, a church planting lead. One of the roles that I was doing before um, taking up the, the role of acting Bishop of Carlisle was working with parishes and mission communities about church planting. We're looking particularly in Barrow, in Carlisle, and uh, north of this, or on the 86 corridor north of Keswick, and trying to do a rural church plant to see how we might learn how to do that well, and church revitalization. Um, so, I, I have discovered that I don't have quite so much time. I was, you know, I was, I was, I was sitting around, my, you know, sitting on my hands, and you know, when I was Bishop of Penrith. Uh, <laughs> but, but certainly, the piece of work that I that actually really needs to focus over this coming year, particularly, is that church planting work. When we had a fantastic and exciting meeting with uh, some people from Manchester, I think called the Antioch Network, who do estates church planting. Uh, we met with them uh, earlier this week, and we are looking at, at some church revitalisation, the church planting in the west of Carlisle, um, on some of the estates there. We're working with Tony and Robin and Stuart and others, in, and, and Vernon's adding that up uh, in Barrow, looking at how we might do some work at church planting estates in, in Barrow, and again, as I say, uh, in, in Keswick. But somebody who can come and, and do do that piece of work with us to, so that when we come to having a, putting a bid in, we've got, the, we've got the plan in place that says, this is what we want to do, London, give us the money. And we've, and we've considered all the different options. So, somebody, so we've been given the money to employ that person to take that piece of work forward. And I should say that our, our ambition is not to say, oh, well, we've done something in, in Carlisle, we've done something in Barrow, we've done something in Keswick, but rather that those bits of work if we found new congregations, new worshiping communities, new people coming to Christ, then actually that's a wave that we then move to other places. That actually you know, we grow something. People there say, I feel like God's calling me to, to go and do this somewhere else. And then we send them on. So that it's not a kind of fixed term project that ends, but rather something that spills out. And is, and is alongside and supportive of and, and deeply connected to our existing church communities. And that in fact, this is actually a, a, a reclamation of a thing that the church has always done. I, I, as you know, I was vicar of a, of, of a church in Kemble, and so many churches around there were, were planted at various, in various centuries by the church in Kemble. Our churches have done all those things, so we're trying to reclaim that. So church plant lead, and then, and then finally, well not finally, but, but we're also looking at a growing younger and able to, to work um, with uh, Network Youth Church, with interns, um, we're, 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 we're structuring that, that job. Hopefully, it'll be doable because at the moment, it will be, if we put all those things in, it would be ridiculous. But that sense of trying to support the, the wonderful work that uh, people are doing with Network Youth Church, our, our interns, growing younger leaders, 
Um, so there is some other bits and pieces which, are, which, are, which we will pay for ourselves, but which are aimed at supporting local ministry, um, operation support, some interim ministry in, in, in places where they were hoping for some, some, new, some things to happen sooner. If we put the bid in in January, they were hoping that we'd be doing it by the summer. Well, we, because of the delay, we can't do it, so we're going to be paying for some, or doing some interim work in the meantime to support those places and those parishes. So that's where we are at with the Dyson Investment Programme. We're really grateful and glad and to have the money. We are going to get on with, with doing that work and preparing for the bigger thing that, that we're going to do in January. But, just to emphasise that we aren't waiting for January, we aren't then waiting for the summer after that to begin the work. We are starting that and continuing that now. I'm going to turn now to Rachel to talk to us. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. It's really nice to look around and see quite a few people I already know, even though it's only my eighth week. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know those of you that I don't know. So hopefully I'll speak to you a bit before, before you leave. Um, as Bishop Bob's already explained, it's a new role with the longest title in the world and a very important comma apparently. Um, and, uh, and obviously new, I'm new as well to the diocese. So, um, the brief that I have is captured in the in slide, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, mission communities and mission community development, vocations and ministry strategy. I just want to give a bit of a nod to the presentation I gave to Bishop Council, which was titled 19 Days and Counting, because it was my 19th day. Um, very original. Uh, and really the core cool part of that presentation was some reflections on having been dashing around the diocese at great speed and meeting lots of different people in different contexts um, and then offering um, a reflection back and an analysis really of, of what my kind of key observations and findings were. Um, the general sort of feedback at the end of that was, yes Rachel, we recognise that and it feels real. Um, so in some ways this presentation is a continuation of that and there are a couple of slides from the last, the last one, the one to Bishop Council, um, which I hope is helpful in just kind of orientating everybody um, to, what, to where I'm at in my thinking, but also uh, how that informs sort of our development plan. So I'll be showing what's happening now and I'll be showing what's happening next within sort of these three key areas. The first slide that I'm going to turn to in a minute is um, focused on sort of critical success factors for mission communities and then I'm going to look a bit about barriers and that's all based on what people have told me. I think one of the advantages of being really new, um, so that's new to working within the church in this kind of role, um, I'm not new to the diocese, I've been in the diocese and worshipping the diocese since 1996, um, but I think that newness and I hope that openness is encouraging people to be super honest. So. I'm hoping that as you sit there and see some of these things, they'll resonate for you too. Okay, Dave, here we go. Let's see if I crack the technology. Yes, yeah, okay. So hopefully you can see most, most of that in terms of the size of the font. So at the risk of sounding like a Tory, I'm going to say three words. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, it's absolutely been the critical in terms of what folk have offered back, um, but it's underpinned by meeting and praying regularly. So yes, it's the quality of relationships, but it's that meeting and praying regularly. Where mission communities appear to be more advanced and working well, people have talked about the hallmarks of respect, trust, honesty, cooperation and openness at being at the heart of their working relationships. What's been really interesting is there's a positivity and a buy-in to the concept of mission communities which is really palpable in the conversations with clergy and laity who are fully engaged and that's really struck me as I've been going around. This is where I'm key one. This is about doing things differently. Someone said to me as I um, arrived today, it's not about putting the deck chairs on the Titanic a little differently. Yeah, it, is, it is a key change, um, and we need to recognise that. 
What's also been really striking is the importance of leadership competence um, in, in an advanced mission community. Seemingly, it can be provided by clergy or laity, but it absolutely needs to be there. We cannot underestimate that mission communities are a really complex leadership task, which requires skill, energy and time. There is a perception of a leadership, a learning, sorry, and development vacuum in terms of clergy training doesn't necessarily include an opportunity to develop core leadership skills. Our diocesan training doesn't include any input on mission communities and the training provided some time ago was experienced as not actually telling people what they needed to do. So it feels like we have got a gap there that we need to look at addressing. <coughs> What's also evident as a success factor is when clergy are engaging and developing laity at all levels to focus on mission, um, but there's a real recognition that this takes time, energy and capacity. There's a need to be action focused in that undertaking, so we can't just talk about it folks, we need to do something. Um, and then we need to offer choice, this mixed ecology, our garden metaphor um, in sort of truly coming to light in that mixed ecology of church. And that diversity of churchmanship and place came up as really important, um, particularly in a rural context where you may have uh, several churches within a parish or benefice. And also the necessity that we need to um, encourage and support people to feel they can be courageous, courageous leaders, courageous teams, um, and to take risks and be innovators. innovators. There are a couple of examples that I really want to share with you to illustrate that in terms of what people shared with me. Um, folk had learned really that they were simply never going to take everyone with them and recognised it was directing energy from where, away from where it should be. And if they had their time again, they would have been more courageous and not fudged it initially. I'm discovering there's a lot of anger can fudge. Um, secondly, they built a, a mission community leadership team with depth because they realised they needed considerable expertise, time and energy um, to make this work. Now that's not always going to be possible in every place because of the nature of the gifts and the talents and the people that we have there. And finally, they avoided getting into legal and structural territory by being creative and stretching the rules a bit to accommodate what they were trying to achieve, often with the centre's support. What I think was really striking is I had absolutely no sense and I have to tell you this is not, has not yet changed at UK, that there was much conversation and cross-fertilisation across mission communities. So where it's working well, is not necessarily cracked being able to share that with others who perhaps are not finding it quite so straightforward. So, moving on to barriers to success. People want their local vicar and they don't understand what a mission community is about and this is still an issue, and it hasn't gone away. There is something about the impact of our messaging at point of launch, um, resulting in a not very deep commitment to mission communities. So what hasn't seemed to have helped in, for some people is it's not seen as a very good word, the, word, the two words mission communities, because it's got mixed up with reducing the number of clergy and the parish offer, which has resulted in quite a defensive response with folk and I found this be living in Cumbria, working all across the county, who have very long memories. So if we don't get that right, we can afford to, uh, to know that it's going to come back and bite us. And then there's a perception that mission communities are unclear in their purpose, overcomplicated and prescriptive. It seems like our approach to enable local evolution hasn't quite landed. Um, and I think that uh, I've already referenced alternative perspectives regarding an information and training before, but we, we have folks who feel like we're being too prescriptive and others um, are, are more cool with it. So it looks like we haven't quite got that, that right, as I say. So work to be done. There's a lived experience of tribalism within the life of mission communities. I'm not going to give any examples because uh, that would actually not honour the confidentiality and discretion that I've offered to people. Um, but I suspect that won't be um, a complete surprise to people sat in the room. Um, then recruitment of affected, diverse and ecumenical mission community leaders is a challenge. Recruitment is a big issue, we probably all recognise that. Um, in this context, what came up was twofold. We need to try to get a bit better at not putting the wrong people in the wrong place. And when we can't change the people, then we need to change the people. That's not me saying it, 
that's what some of you, not necessarily you personally, have reflected back to me. So there was a significant theme about responsibility and accountability, particularly when it came to recruiting people to <coughs> mission community leaders who then didn't engage with their responsibility. come up slightly differently than expected. Right, volume of work in mission community leadership has been underestimated. It's complex and it takes time. I talked about that on the success factors. Um, and balancing this with pastoral responsibilities came up as a real issue. Um, there's a feeling this isn't understood and there's a need for practical and operational support. This is compounded by considerable clergy time being spent on administration tasks and bureaucracy and not on mission. Clergy workload has been a real golden thread through many conversations. Um, a sense folk aren't able to concentrate on the right things because everything else gets in the way. They are perceived by some of our denominational colleagues as uh, being a vehicle for undertaking Anglican business that others don't recognise. So one of the examples was about parish offer and budgeting within a mission community. Um, and I suppose it prompted quite an interesting question really. A mission community is about doing mission or resourcing mission. And I'll leave that with you. The boundaries of mission communities are not necessarily coterminous with our ecumenical partners' areas of responsibilities, and that makes working collaboratively even more difficult. And finally, this is kind of my initial assessment on the 19th day, and again, not fundamentally changed, that there's something here about addressing the structures, the people, and the development issues, and doing that in tandem will be really key if we're going to kind of turn the dial on this. And that was very much the focus of my previous presentation. So before I move to the next slide, one of the other things that came has come up quite a lot is, and quite a common feature in some of the conversations is that people say to me, I have no idea whether there's even a functioning mission community in this time. <coughs> okay, not, not a clue. Um, and other people say, I don't know where my bits on the sense of, well, are other people having the same struggles or getting on with it a bit better or, or maybe finding more of a challenge. So I was a visible woman on a mission really and that I was determined I was going to bring something to this presentation to hopefully help with that. So for the DITBID we needed to undertake um, some analysis on mission community development um, and that's the data that I've used for this next slide. However, um, there was definitely learning from the exercise as I understand it, it predates me and there's, and there's a need to fine tune some of the kind of uh, processes and framework in which we approach that. So I've been quite pragmatic, really, in my interpretation of, of the detailed work others have done. I needed to keep it really simple, because that's not what this presentation is about, and very headline for the purposes of today. Um, and I've chosen to sort of adopt a kind of health of the nation approach. Um, but what you're going to read on the next slide is, is my language, and my interpretation, and no one else's. Okay? So, it's about missional and financial health of our mission community. And I hope it's not too much of a surprise. So we have 34 altogether. And we've got around four-ish that are advanced. We've got three that are struggling. So this is a mission communities that are struggling. This is not a judgment about people. And there, as you saw with the barriers, there are lots of reasons why they might be struggling. But that's, that's their reality. And then we've got quite a lot sort of in the middle. So we've got quite a few who are working well and moving towards advanced and then a number who are making progress. So I hope for other people in the room who might well have also been asking the kind of questions that are asked me, or I'm not really quite sure where we're at. I'm hoping even though that's kind of pragmatic, high level, I'm not overly scientific um, because it's my interpretation of some of the data I've seen, but I hope at least it's a stick in the sand as a place to start from, and it offers kind of a sense of where we're up to. Okay, so, building momentum. As Bishop Rob said, we are not standing still, folks. And I certainly haven't joined the diocese to stand still, so hopefully that, that uh, is good news. So, support, I think, needs to be needs-led and collaboratively offered. And one of the things I've been really, really delighted about is um, even Richard, who's going, openness to working with me. I've been trying to download his organisational memory before he goes, for obvious reasons. Um, but I've been really uh, welcomed and valued the openness of Vernon and Stuart to developing a partnership with me. 
um, and our plan is to meet really regularly. We're going to try six weekly to begin with, um, so that we can start to I can start to understand and tap into what Bishop Bob was talking about before that real um, detailed knowledge, understanding of where mission communities are at, where clergy are individually, where, where the support is best needed, um, so that hopefully my team can uh, be much more responsive um, and locally driven, that we can reduce some of the silo working um, and really over time start to develop a two or three way process that's coming both from the parish level, mission community level, from the archdeacons and from my team in terms of understanding where do we most need to be working so that we work smarter and not as hard, um, but we maximise the resources that we've got. So, we've been working on something called the Garden Planner, which I can't actually take much credit for because it was written before I arrived. But what I can take credit for is my absolute mission to get this draft out for feedback. <laughs> So I have some with me today. I'm carrying them around in my car everywhere I go. Um, so I'm going to do a Blue Peter. Here's one we prepared earlier. It has draft written all over it so that when we actually get the final version, you know, we're not going to end up with confusion. But essentially it sets out the six things that a mission community should be doing. The fact that we still need to clarify this over 10 years in, I think says something about where we're at. So we need to build some momentum, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so this is out for feedback at the moment. Already we've had some really great spots, really great spots. And if we had simply produced it without doing that, we would have made some errors. So please, please take a copy, have a read. It's not that long. It's actually quite interesting. There's lots of pictures. Um, and if you could either email Stuart or myself with your feedback in the next week or so, we'd be really grateful. Please don't tell us it's great. Tell us what we can do to improve it too. Thank you. Do tell us it's great as well. <laughs> <laughs> Modest. <laughs> the next thing um, is around the role of mission community leader. We need to clarify it and enable it. So it's, it's been trying to hit a moving target, this one. Some people I've, I've asked them, they said, oh, no, it's still being worked on. And other people say, oh, no, it's done. And then I've been sent different versions. So as you can tell, we need to just do a bit of work on it in terms of clarifying what is our finished product then I think uh, formatting it and consulting again. But hopefully that's going to really clarify the role of mission community leader. For those of you in that, you're probably thinking, phew, thank goodness for that. Um, the other bit, which I touched on uh, in the earlier slides, is there is the real need to develop our leaders and share what's working. We have some super talented people in this diocese. Really, honestly, it's really impressive. And uh, we, we're not really shining a light on some of that brilliance and sharing that with each other. Um, we are an amazing place. Uh, let's help each other and celebrate it. So we also want to uh, approach this as a county-wide offer, but it's likely to be locally delivered, and that's because many of you are telling us that's what you like. You haven't got time to attend another meeting, but you'd really like some input in, a, in part of a mechanism processes that you're already part of. Um, so very much hope that we'll continue to have conversations around what that looks like with you. So no one is done to, it's done with. And then um, measuring progress and impact has to be done, folks. I know it's perhaps not necessarily everybody's comfort zone, but we do really need to, because we want to facilitate a successful bid, uh, dip bid that Bishop Rob was talking about by maximising our capacity funding. So you've already heard about the roles that we have got funding for. I think the easiest way to think about this next 12 months um, and I can't take credit for this, others have used this, this language, but I think it's really easy and helpful to explain it. The next 12 months are going to be preparing. So our dip bid is called the Cumbrian Way. So we're going to be preparing for the Cumbrian Way. That's what all these roles are going to do. And hopefully, um, by enabling us to plan, develop and support, we will capture that momentum and be able to evidence it in our dip bid and then credibly explain why they should continue to invest in us. And then hopefully, the best is still to come. I just wanted to set the scene. This is another slide from Bishop's Council. So uh, the way that I've made sense of developing our people for mission is it's kind of, uh, if I had a flip chart, I'd draw it as well. So in, in effect, we've got a shepherd in every community to use, to use Bishop Rob's language from when he talks about the priorities for the next two years. And we need to enable you guys to have the time, capacity to encourage, discern and train. So that's happening in the middle. 
then that needs to be supported by mission communities that are working and well-led who are committed to engaging and developing laity at all levels with a focus on mission. And then the final bit of the circle wrapping around is a cohesive and coordinated God for All uh, team that's delivering related activity. Whether that's mission ministry development, church planting, fresh expressions, growing younger, but we need to get all those three bits moving together to build and sustain momentum. And I just wanted to share that before moving on to my last slide. So, let me go back for a minute. Um, this is one of my priorities. We don't have one, but we need it. So, uh, I won't be sitting writing this in the cupboard because um, that would be as much use as a chocolate teapot. We need to be engaging with key stakeholders, and that includes you, um, so that we produce a plan that really is based in the real world and what's needed at grassroots level, um, so that it really meets need. There's a risk that it becomes a bit of a beast, so we need to stay quite focused, I think. Um, but what I have tried to do in this slide, really, is to give you a sense of the strategic context for that plan, um, and I would welcome some feedback if you think we've missed something. But it really reflects a combination of our God for All strategy, uh, Bishop God's priorities for the next two years, and I think recognises the broader context of, in which the diocese is operating. Clearly the purpose of any mission, ministry development plan is the impact. And the impact we're striving to have is greater mission and ministry across the diocese. It's as simple as that. Um, but for it to be effective, it can't just be in glorious isolation. So it needs to complement and support the work of mission communities, which I've covered in a previous slide. And that's why I've approached the presentation in the order that I have, because one thing naturally builds to, get to another. So, vocations, as you've already heard, need to be our collective focus. That's the message that my team is getting loud and clear. Um, I just want to offer this as an example, really. It's National Vocations Day on the 21st of April, so there's another plug. Um, and we are going to try to be really strategic in our intent and action. So we need to think carefully about the fact we have one person doing seven hours on vocations at the moment. If she does a sermon on the 21st of April, she can be one person in one place. However, if we use our digital capacity and invite Bishop Rob, which he's agreed, to do a, a, a piece that really frames our commitment to vocations and uses National Vocations Day as a vehicle for really communicating that message across the diocese. And we then utilise the national resources from the church for Vocation Sunday and make those readily available digitally and produce some sermon notes so that those of you who are preaching, whether you're lay or clergy, don't have to start from scratch, but you've got resources to support you. Then we've got an opportunity to have much greater impact across the diocese than one person doing one sermon on a Sunday. So um, that's the kind of approach I think we need to be taking in terms of that working smarter, not harder, and trying to be more effective. Enabling personal vocation in both church and non-church contexts, which again Bishop Rob spoke about, and to encourage, support, and enable people of all abilities. So, if we are truly committed to this, which I very much hope that we are, then we need to recognise that we need to offer development which is needed and engaging. People are not going to come to something that looks a bit boring. Um, and in my mind, this needs to be locally driven. We can't be sitting in our office in church house thinking this is a good idea. It has to come from the ground. And we also need to identify and reduce the barriers people may face. If it's people of all abilities, then there will be issues around um, confidence, geography, finance, just to name a couple. We need to look at those and really think carefully about how we enable people to engage. We've got to have clear pathways for what next. That's really struck me as I've been talking to people. Quite a few people have talked about, I do this, but I don't know what comes next. And then we need to have effective recruitment strategies that are bespoke to each programme so that we don't have something we advertise and then don't run because nobody's come. If we can get all those pieces moving, um, then we've got a good chance of providing something that will be really enabling. This one circles back to the previous slide, really, around shepherding every community. Um, this will not work because it's written down. It will work because we ensure our shepherds have the time and capacity to give this important task. And that's why that systemic approach is absolutely vital. Just to give you a bit of a flavour of something that I think you would expect to see in the plan. Um, so post Cameron, Butland, we're looking at, um, as a diocese to how we can support our leaders with mentoring and spiritual direction. Although I'm aware many clergy seek that themselves, 
Um, it's just one of the examples of some of the detail you could you can, could kind of expect to see, um, and that's a piece of work that I'm, I'm currently uh, undertaking. Provision of quality lay and clergy training. So we need to continue to develop our relationship with the Manual Theological College, ETC, but we need to be really clear about what we need to support the development of our people, if it's people of all abilities. So there needs to be a focus and commitment on that, and then our training offer through our formal relationships needs to reflect that too. And that's going to be about challenge and encouragement, I hope. Effective clergy recruitment, induction and deployment. Clearly, we know our, uh, this is a great place to work. We know we're really distinctive, but how do we communicate that from a ministry development perspective? And obviously, this crosses over um, with areas of other, that others have responsibility for too, but it needs to be an important part of our plan. There's also something about how we induct and support people and deploy them effectively. So they have a really positive experience of a word I use from my old world of onboarding. So one of the current tasks is to set and coordinate introduction to the diocese days, probably initially twice a year, um, with really relevant content with key stakeholders present. So you know people have a bit of a compass when they join us and they know who to go to for what and also what they're part of. So watch this space, hopefully it won't be too long until you hear about those. Championing and proactively supporting clergy wellbeing, uh, it's so, so important. There's going to be a preventative focus on that within the plan. It needs to be woven like a golden thread through all our activity. I, I think a key question we need to be asking ourselves is how, why and what are we asking of our clergy? <coughs> Doing more and more simply isn't sustainable. And to quote someone in this room, it's not Christian. So post-pandemic, crisis in our public services, especially in relation to health provision awaiting this, are some of those broader influences I was referencing earlier in terms of we need to reduce stigma, we need to increase our valuing of well-being, and we need to make sure it's a key offering and a universally accessible offer in our plan. Investment in continued ministerial development, support, faith and vocation. We obviously already do a great deal of this and this will be a core part of the plan, whether it's the MDR process, the annual clergy away days, the CMDD, the provision of the CMD grant. We're very good at acronyms, by the way. And then finally, support and develop ministers to deliver a mixed ecology, including pioneering and church planting. So Bishop Bob's already talked about this, but one of his priorities for the next two years is for every mission community to be pioneering. Hooray, this is exciting. Um, so we need to really support that with the expansion of our church planting ambition in Barrow, Carlisle and St Aidan's, which is the name of our new A66 rural plant. I'll get me a brownie point for Stuart. Um, but the plan needs to be developed in this context. So we need to capture and cascade learning and what works and we need to make sure that we build and sustain that. There's also something here around growing younger as well. It's a key feature of uh, some of our church planting plans, but there's also the join up with schools. There are various touch points in which we could um, engage with children, young people and families, and some of us may well be doing so, but at the moment we seem to think about young people in silos, um, and that's something that we're currently having a really good look at, both myself and Charlotte. So, for developing new worshipping communities and finding new ways to do church, we'll ensure we can have worshipping, praying and serving communities in as many local places as possible. That's the ambition. <coughs> so just a final reflection, really, from me before I stop talking. Um, I just want to reiterate something I said before. I am really thrilled to be here. I am so fortunate that there are so, so much talent and great people who want great things. I don't think I've ever been prayed for so much in my life since I started. You know, people have been so encouraging, supportive and open. You are great. We are great. We can do fantastic things. It's just how we harness that to maximise our mission and ministry in this diocese, and I look forward to doing more of that with you. Thank you. Rachel, thank you so much. There's an awful lot of, uh, of content there. I think you can sort of pick up just how much... Sort of tightening up of things, of focusing on the right things and trying to kind of listen, listen and engage with what, what people are actually saying on the ground um, that, that Rachel has done and we're really seeing the, the, the effect of that, so thank you. Um, I just, I'm going to open up for any comments or questions in a sec, and, and I just wanted to, but I want to say that so much of what we're doing is 
the focus is about enabling people on the ground because actually this is about what you're doing where you are. How, you, how the local church, that you, the churches you are part of, are helping people come to know Jesus, helping people grow in faith and seeking the kingdom and the, the joy and the wonder and the, uh, and the hope and the healing of the kingdom where you are. This is not about having a fantastic set of agendas by a diocese, but rather how as a collective church together, diocese, we support what you discern God is calling you to, to do those things. Help people know Jesus, grow in faith, seek in the kingdom where you are. And uh, it's a really, it just feels very exciting to me, what we're, what we're up to, really exciting. Um, any just quick thoughts or questions? Yes. Is there any way that those styles can be sacred to us in parishes? Because there's just so much there. It's fantastic. I'm just asking if it's possible. James, um, yeah. great. Thanks, James. Thank we can you. circulate that. Great. James. James Richards with uh, me. For the resources for vacation Sunday, um, on any given Sunday, two of our churches have lay led services with people who may simply deliver a pre existing reflection on the scripture and others who will work some kind of sermon of their own. Please, could those resources embrace the possibility that someone might just be reading something out on a Sunday, whereas others will be preparing a sermon? Okay, great. Thanks, Joseph. That's really helpful. Any other? Okay, good. In which case, thank you. Um, Jim, I'm going to hand over to you for, the, for our DVR. Um, Follow that. <laughs> okay. So this is up the trustees of the Board of Finance opportunity to report to you, the members of the Board of Finance, as to what we've been up to since we last met in October. At this stage, in early March, it's too early to know how 2024 is going to turn out. We have one or two components in place, one of which is the expectation of parish offer, which has gone up by over 2% since 2023, and thank you very much indeed for doing that. This is not a downer remark, it's just a comparator. We'll be about 2.5% up if we collect everything that's been offered. Inflation, as you know, possibly um, during this current year, will struggle to get down to that level. So. We're still in a catch-up mode. Our spending power is, is still getting a little bit weaker from the core income of element of parish offer. Um, but that's not in itself um, the total picture, because the total picture is, during 2023, we continue to rationalize our assets on our balance sheet. We have a lot of property, houses, some of which are surplus to requirements, and even when we might wish to keep something because we might put a church planter in or we might have a house for duty person, we might have a curate. Actually, until we really know where we really do need people, hanging on to properties is expensive because they need maintained and the rent that we can get for them is a lot less than we could by simply selling it and putting the money into investments or at the moment, indeed, on cash deposit. With CCLA, if the parishes don't know this, it's important to know, we can get 5.3% just by putting money on a deposit account. That's a lot more than the clearing banks will give you. How do they do it? They do it by investing in a myriad of banks, um, 50 or so. And the combined effect of that, with the varying interest rates that are being offered from various economies throughout the world, is that they can offer us something equivalent to the current bank base rate. Absolutely superb. You'd be struggling to get recurrent, non-risk yields 
of above that through doing other forms of investment. But through CCLA, they do have two main portfolios that we use, the General Investment Fund, which will yield just under 3%, but you've got capital fluctuation, and the Properties Fund, which will yield 5%. Not so much capital fluctuation. That happens over a period of time rather than as related to day-to-day -day movements in stock markets throughout the world. But we're not bothered about the capital value so much as the income that can be generated. So our policy during the past 12 months, well, continuing actually over several years, has been to look rationally at all the assets that we have in our balance sheet, bits of land here, house there, office there, something like that, which we've used for investment purposes to generate income, some of which has generated less than 1% per annum based on the capital value, some we get more than 2% on tenanted houses, we're doing very well. And remember, we don't necessarily get end-to-end -end tenancies, and we do get lots of repairs at the end of a lot of tenancies, which we have to pay for out of the rents we've received, etc. So there's a risk there. If we can convert that into something which takes no management at all and produces 5% or more, that's 3% at least benefit, and in some cases, 4%. <coughs> Every million pounds we can do that with, and we did three million during 2023, realising assets and putting them into alternative investments, which are safe. Every million pounds will generate, therefore, between 30 and 40,000 pounds extra in income, which means that we can supplement the costs of ministry, which doesn't come from parish offer. To put it into context, in 2023, the direct costs of ministry were 5.2 million and the income from parish offer was 4.1. So there's a gap of 1.1. Some of that is met through increasing our investment income and our rents from Glebes and all the rest of it, constantly trying to squeeze more money out of our assets. It has never been our policy to pay down our asset values in order to supplement current costs, because that's a pathway to ruin. Our policy has been to sustain the maximum we can towards mission, which the Bishop's Council and ultimately yourselves determine how it's deployed. Our job is to generate as much resource as can be deployed and used by Bishop's Council and Synod to promote mission. And that encapsulates really what, what we're up to, that's our purpose. So in 2023, uh, we once again can report that we beat our budget. Our budget was a small loss. Uh, we had a spending of 300,000 less in the year on cost of ministry. Again, the same thing I repeat to you every time I speak to you. It's a result of delays in recruitment, inabilities to recruit, or whatever, to fill ministry posts when they become vacant. And we wish it were different. And if you recall the last time we met, the budgets going forward to 2028, which we had another look at, um, because of inflation being higher than normal, and because of the fact that we were repeatedly reporting better than budgeted results because of the ministry factor that I just explained. Um, we took that into account in order to make the budgets for the next three or four years look more realistic. I was going to say better, but you know, that implies that we're just fiddling it, but we're not. We're trying to take current factors into account in projecting forward. And another relative fa relevant factor, in the five years up to 2023, we turned in nearly half a million pounds more surplus than we budgeted for, which was a break-even. And we applied that to the coming five years on the basis of a covenant with you guys in the parishes, all of us, that we paid for costs that hadn't been incurred. That was basically it. So, and we were showing sizable losses going forward. So we supplemented that position by putting that surplus in. And over the 10 years, the idea was, we hope, we're break even. We're still in that position, and, and, that, and that's good to report. Um, 
We sold three million pounds worth of assets during the past year. The majority of that came from a farm. People will tell you it's sensible to hold land. They're not making any more, and it's going up in value all the time. There's an illogicality in that because we're also told that yields from farming is, are pathetic and getting worse. Uh, so I don't really understand it and I don't need to for this purpose here. But why are we holding land when £2 million worth produces 30,000 plus rent in a year? It's back to this yield basis, 1.5% doesn't make sense. 5 or 5.3 on cash deposit does make sense. More money for ministry, more money for the bishop and his team, etc. So that's us, in a nutshell, talking about 2023. It's still subject to audit, but Rick assures me that he's no real um, reason to believe that there will be substantial changes in the audit, which will take place in the next couple of months, and you'll be asked to approve the accounts in June when we meet again uh, for our annual meeting at Synod. Looking forward into this year, as I've said, for once, first time in many years, Parish Upper looks like it's on the up, and that's brilliant. We hope it continues. Obviously, no crystal balls, but we're budgeting that it does. So, hope springs eternal. And some smaller things. You've heard, well not small, but relatively small, because we have a seven to eight million pound business here in terms of turnover. The 600,000 that we were able to uh, su succeed in getting just recently towards continuing the sustainability, the growth, the investment programs that Bishop Robs elucidated, um, we need to provide some matched funding to enable all that to happen. And that is taken into account in, in our budgeting. It's a fact that new initiatives generally take a wee bit of time, if ever, to generate more money. Um, and so that will be a continuing factor, and that's why the big bid is so important, which has been deferred until we can get it right. But we, as well as many other dioceses, in fact every other diocese, are becoming increasingly more reliant on funding from the church commissioners in order to pay our way. Now, we'd like to think that that will continue to be a growing element in, in, in diocese funding. But we must be aware that throughout the country there are dioceses in very much worse financial conditions than we are, because we're not in a bad financial position, but some are in terminal decline financially. They rely to a massive degree on central church funding. And what we've got to be careful of and keep watch of is that we continue to fight hard for what we see as our legitimate share from a position of some success rather than from a position of default and need. Um, and there's a temptation, obviously, if you were dishing out funds, to give funds to the neediest. Now, what are the neediest? If you were running a commercial group producing a range of products, you'd probably decide, if you were wise, not to keep investing in things that aren't selling but to actually invest in the things that could sell more. We would use that as an argument in any bids that we make for central funding, but we are very much grant dependent. Like any charity, we can't pay our way just by our own means. Not a problem, we can deal with it, but it's a way of life. Um, now, Rydal, Rydal Hall. We have in our midst Richard Pratt, who has I was going to say he's turned it round, he hasn't done it single-handedly, but he's motivated <coughs> a change of direction in Rival. Everything we do at Rival has got to have a missionary base, otherwise it doesn't make sense uh, as a diocese, holding that as an asset, which has been losing money. During the last couple of months, we met with the Rival board, having initially talked to them in July last year, but in January we had a presentation all the right aboard were there, uh, of, a, of a rational five-year plan going forward. And in the foreseeable future, that could wipe its face. If it doesn't, I don't think that's a problem, if we have recognisable missional value as a missional outreach vehicle for this diocese. If the missionary aspects aren't right, then it's not worth a piece of cake. So 
you know, and Richard has actually got that attitude right, and the new manager is very focused on doing that. He used to run Buckfast Abbey. We're not yet distilling hooch, yeah, <laughs> but it's a possibility. <laughs> but what we are distilling is uh, water into energy, because the Rydal and Scandale Beck hydro plants are very, very productive in terms of income for us. And we've got fixed tariffs now going forward for several years, which are very beneficial. So when we sell into the grid, we get good money. And, and that's wonderful, that. It's an investment of a million pounds in each of them, uh, which we made several years ago. But we did it through due diligence and with people who know how to do it. Gilbert Jokes who make the pumps in Kendall and all the rest of it. It's a network of people that know what they're doing. And we help to find the capital. It would be great if we could find, find more schemes like that, uh, which produced yields like that. But I think we got in at the right time and perhaps it's harder to get. But it's something to keep an eye on for the future. Because if the country is going to become more sustainable in terms of energy, there will be opportunities, no doubt, for central government to support investments in that pump priming, and we want to be part of it if we can. At the moment, we do have 5% or so coming in from our capital investments. But we could get 10 or 15 from similar sorts of hydro schemes were we to be able to identify them if the finances and the grants and the tariffs were right at the time. So we're keeping our eye on that, but we're not budgeting for it because we can't actually put our finger on where they might be at the moment. It could happen. On Restore, another subsidiary, uh, no financial worries there. It expands its activity. It has big opportunities to do so, particularly in Carlisle with the redesign of the centre and the university going down towards the station in the old citadel where they restore want to have an establishment which can minister to students and, and, and also perhaps act as a source of cheap goods for them to furnish their lodgings and, and whatnot. So to get where the young people are, and other people too, but we've got shops in Carlisle which, which can deal with the general population. This would be a core part of the university, so working strongly with them. So lots of things going on outside the normal run of the mill churches. Um, but even with the run of the mill churches, we've heard so much about what the future might bring um, to supplement what we currently are used to. As I look around the room, we've been brought up in a different era, most of us. Um, but we have to change, we have to adapt, we have to get younger, or we, dare I say, you know what happens, we, time expires. So, those are my remarks, really. I think I've probably said as much as I need to about where we've been subject to audit, where we're going, a bit early to see, but the home ends are, are favourable, inflation's coming down, so the gap between what we can collect in and what we need to spend, which has been, the last two years has been going up skywards, hopefully that starts to get a bit more sensible and, uh, and we can look forward with some confidence. To the business of the agenda, You've got the minutes of the last time we met on the 14th of October. Do you accept them as a factual record? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Number three, succession planning. In, 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 in the autumn, is it October or November, something like that, we all, all of us, have to stand for re-election, if we wish, to all the committees in the diocese and the DPF trustee board is the same, except that uh, in the trustee board, we can do three years times three if we get re-elected. So you can do a, a maximum of nine years. Now we're quite fortunate actually in the DBF trustee board that there's, there's only me whose time will expire. The rest, if they wish, uh, will continue and I hope that they do. Uh, we've got a good strong board. Over the years we've built up our strengths based on skills and needs and experience at senior level in managing a secular business because that is what we are that's what we do as a board of trustees we look after the secular the material the assets so that the bishops council and the synod can look after the delivery of the pastoral and the mission and i think it's it's, it's right for me to say that we need people to stand for election who have those sorts of skills. 
It's, it's not a good will body, it's not a feel nice body. It's a body that has to take hard decisions in a business-like way. And we're fortunate at the moment to have a good group of people who can do that. It works well. And the reason why it is effectively useful for the diocese is because if you don't have that materially based body to complement the spiritually based bishops council to bring a combined set of policies with influences from both sides to you for the running of the diocese, then there's an imbalance there. And we built that up over the last few years. We've, I think we've had a very, very effective cross-fertilizing relationship between the one and the other. We can only do that if we get the right people on the DPN. So if you are one of those people who think you can devote the time from experience of taking serious business decisions, some difficult, others more difficult, <laughs> um, or you know people who could, then please encourage them to stand for election in October. In the meantime, a couple of months ago, we put out a flyer saying if people had experience, particularly in the investment management or property management fields, could they please put themselves up? Uh, and as a result of that, we got, uh, well, we got a one-all draw. <laughs> because two people, um, one with particular property expertise and one with particular financial and investment expertise, um, I twisted one of them's arm, the other one applied voluntarily. <laughs> the one who applied voluntarily, unfortunately, driving in a car after she'd received the per she had received the papers for previous meetings, had taken fright and said, my goodness me, this is involved. And it is. I mean, we have 130 houses for a start off, and we have 104 schools, and we have 300 parishes, and we have loads of people, and all. it's a big business. Anyway, it took fright, full-time job anyway, I don't think I can cope because I, if I, I don't want to go into something if I can't come in. So that didn't happen. But we're lucky in that we do have good professional advisors serving our subcommittee on properties. We could still do with more one, one more person to co-opt to that committee, even if they weren't a trustee, we can, we can co-opt specialists to committees, subcommittees. On the investment side, success. Chap called Trevor Hebden. Some of you may be familiar with the name. He used to be chairman of the Cumberland Building Society board. Uh, he was appointed, having been a Barclays Bank regional manager, he was appointed to run H and H, Harrison Hetherington is the big auction group, properties group, all sorts of things, when they needed somebody to look at their finances, and then after he turned that round, uh, somebody who knew more about the farming side of things, agriculture and other things a more operational person, was, was appointed in his place. Uh, Trevor is a, uh, he, he's on the chapter of the cathedral. Uh, he's, he's, he's deep into things in, in Cumbria, and he knows his patch. And we were fortunate to be able to get him co-opted to the investment committee. So, part of the job's done, but in October, November, uh, I think, serious thinking, how do we continue what we've got with the right people? So I'd encourage you to either think of yourselves or to think of other people who you do know and wind them up a bit to say, get yourselves in there because it's good. And it is good as long as we keep it good. Those are, uh, that covers number three. Right, formality. Two meetings of the trustees uh, since we last met, one in November and one in September. Obviously, September preceded October, we approved those meetings minutes in November, so you didn't get them until they were, and November we approved them in January, and you haven't had the January ones yet because we're having a meeting in a fortnight's time. So, any uh, issues with, well they're for note, but it, it shows you the detail of what we get up to, <coughs> quite comprehensive. Any problems with those, thank you. Do you receive them? Thank, thank you very so much. much, indeed. Now, I'll let you into a little secret. I got my copies of those minutes out of the file that I have. I was told about it two minutes before I stood up that actually the ones you've got relate to 2022 and not to 2023. Oh. Now, I'm not being nasty or naughty here, but we are acknowledging we've made a mistake. We haven't got the right sets of minutes. I think I'm 
and if my information is correct, you've got the wrong ones, we will ensure that you get the right ones sent to you after the meeting. So, and with that, thank you for your attention. And uh, that closes this meeting. Unless there are any questions, please, time for questions if you would. There is one. Rob. Just say they are 2023. Oh, oh, excellent. Well, Rob, uh, Rick, I don't know. <laughs> In that case, all's well. I haven't caught you out. You've caught me. <laughs> any other questions on, on finances? In that case, oh, yes, there is. Val. Well, The team, oh sorry, by the team, I'm sorry, by the team who looked after, um, well, the research into Paris offer, and they were looking at what makes for a good tariff offer and successful tariff offer process, and they found that almost everything didn't make any difference other than planning ahead, so looking forward beyond the one year offer, and working collaboratively. So I went up to, to them and said, hello, I'm from Carlisle Diocese. <laughs> and I felt very pleased to be able to say that. So thank you very much to the team who made that happen um, across uh, the Archdeacon's and, and the team. Thank you. Well, that's great, Val. And those who are in the room, Archdeacons are involved. Derek, Rick, and Sophie's off on leave at the moment, maternity leave. Um, but they're the ones that have really pumped primed the communications with the parishes and mission communities. As a result of which, there's a very obvious pattern of outcomes. Those that have had good communications have responded. And the more the better. So I know that Derek and Rick and others are intent on continuing and expanding the penetration through communication and meetings, physical meetings, treasurers, pie and peace suppers, things like that, to focus on mutual need and mutual ability and supportability. And, and that's got to be good. And thanks very much for raising that, Val, because I should have credited these guys and I didn't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, there aren't any other motions, private members' motions or Dean of Synod's motions. We have had a, uh, a, a question which we need to, about the, the um, slavery redress work, which we will um, hold over for the next uh, Synod, partly because it came, came in after the, the deadline, and partly because I confess that that, that report that's come out this week, um, I, I have not got my head round it yet either. So we need to do a little bit of consideration of that so that we can, we can come back to that at our next meeting. Um, which really leaves me just with, with one other thing to do, I think, which is, I have already alluded to this, but this is Richard's last synod meeting. Um, Richard arrived here in the last century. <laughs> First of all, at St Cuthbert's, and then I mean, as communications officer as well, and uh, then Archdeacon of West Cumberland, and very latterly as Archdeacon of, of, of Carlisle. And um, again, there will be time for us to say other things to you in, in the coming weeks, and to express, express our deep gratitude to you. Um, we, will, we are going to really miss you. Your, your wisdom, your enthusiasm, your insight, um, just your friendship being, being here. We are really grateful to you. And also, for the fact that, I mean, admittedly, we won't be getting emails at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Richard is moving to Scotland, to near Aberdeen, where, to a house where he and Diana will be able to see nobody from their window. <laughs> but you have advanced so many things. You have cared for parishes and people. Uh, in, in so many ways, and we are deeply in, in your debt. And, and, I, and I think what I want to do, apart from, I'm just going to give you a very, very short warning that I am going to ask you to pray the blessing over us at the end. And I'm hoping after all your years in ministry, you'll be able to do that like that. <laughs> um, but I would really like us as a, as a, a, a kind of a vote of thanks, actually not just to Richard, but also Diane, who is not here but who has been such a steadfast support 
the, the, the provider of, of support to richer than so many people, endless Sunday lunches for people, and hospitality. We are really grateful not only to you, but also Diane, and I hope you will convey our thanks to her as well. And, and so may we show our appreciation. And thank you to all, all of you for your attendance today, your, your work with us and uh, our work together. Thank you for, for your attention and, uh, and insights and wisdom today. Um, I'm going to finish with, with a prayer and then I shall ask Richard to bless us as we go. So let's have a moment of quiet and offer all the things we've discussed to God. Praying for the life of, it, of, of God's church here in Cumbria, for our, our witness our, our life of evangelism, of seeking the Lord's kingdom in places where he's called us to serve. Let's offer all that to God. Go before us, O Lord, in all our doings, with thy most gracious favour, and further us with thy continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, and finally by thy mercy obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 I know it's bent, but actually we are here I know it's late, but we are, actually we are here because of the resurrection, aren't we? Fundamentally, we are Christ's risen people, built on the hope of the resurrection. So, I'm going to give an Easter blessing. God the Father, by his glory, Christ was raised from the dead. Strengthen us to walk with him in his risen life. With the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit upon us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Go in peace, the love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.